Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation and respect, the Ink Guild acknowledges that we live, work, and play on the traditional Treaty 7 territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Kaina, and the Bikani nations, as well as the Stony Nakoda and the Sutina nations. This territory is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Finally, we acknowledge all Indigenous and non-Indigenous to honor and celebrate this territory alongside us. Somebody mouth make the imposter noise from Among Us. Good. <laughs> it, it's accurate, but it also sounds like a train just went by my house. Okay, let's quit the podcast. We're going to become the next big, ho- big, big acapella group. <laughs> hey, don't you tempt me. Don't you tempt me. Oh, I, I know you'd be down for it. Yeah. Literally, I just spent the past week doing, like, body music classes. So, you know, I think we're set. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hello, hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey there. Bonjour. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Inkill Podcast. Just go to fucking therapy. (laughs) Don't correct me. I don't care. need to start a revolution. (laughs) I'm going to fucking explode if I don't say this by now. I brought you to this podcast. I can take you out. I'm going to summon up his spirit to fix all of this up for me. He didn't have good enough tea and or comic books, so. And you know what? I'm going to say it. All of them are fucking idiots. Everyone is taking cocaine. (laughs) Just say your morning routine. Big robot. Oh, I die. die and make Victor break out his Hoover vacuum for you to call <laughs> to grow into your dad. Finally, his swordfish was free. Oh, I forgot what I was. Um. Oh, <laughs> you get distracted uh, no! by the game. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Ink Guild podcast. I'm Alex. I'll be your host for this episode. I am joined by Dean. Hello. Gabe. Hello. Tyler. Hi, I'm not the bottom of the list this time. And Michael. Yeah, take that. I'm the bottom of the list. That's right. You stay there. Yeah. This is my favorite part. I'm, no- I'm known as the power bottom. Um. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tonight we're going to be talking about... Bum, bum, ba-da-dum. Weapons, artifacts, and magical items. Wow. Woo. Um, so this is gonna just kind of be, you know, cool things in stories. Weapons are cool, artifacts are cool, magic is cool. Um, I'm just stalling. Should we just jump right into it? Let's do it. <laughs> um, so let's kind of start off with, you know. I guess we can just start off with how we like to see magical items and weapons done in stories. Do you like when everyone has really cool weapons? Do you like when no one has really cool weapons? There are balance to be struck. You know, are we are we a fan of the the MacGuffin trope? That Sorry, answers what? that question. I, I, I love it. What, what's that? What's that clip you have of me in an earlier episode where I say, do we're, we're, I, I, I know every every morning is." Incomplete without a good McMuffin. Say, Some shit like that. Play the clip. <laughs> play the clip. <laughs> Dean, play the clip. <laughs> play the clip. Blood codes are vampires. Summoner codes are the more like traditionally magic, and devil codes are the are devil codes. They're like the MacGuffin of the universe. God, gotta love MacGuffins. <laughs> gotta love a good McMuffin. I don't yeah. really. They're not really MacGuffins because no one's like after them or chasing them but like they're they're an important part in the in the, in the literal story <laughs> i thought you were gonna say they're an important part of they're gonna they're an important part of people's breakfast dean press the button okay. <laughs> i just need to make sure okay all right press the button okay we're good <laughs> um it's like yeah it's like, like i love a good i love, I love a good Mc, yeah mcmuffins are good uh are they yeah. yeah, I think they are. I think they're fun. Yeah, if they're done right, 
I'm as just as imagining as Gabe playing with an actual McMuffin, though. Like, I nothing know, in between I, the well, sandwich. That's why I said all he's just day. got the two halves, and he's clapping them together while giggling. <laughs> like, I love McMuffins. Um, <laughs> we need a, we need a new story with the... Thing. We need a we need a McDonald's sponsored like movie now where they just hunt. Can after we just like have a whole conversation about like corporate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like sponsored by McDonald's. If I can throw my tenure in here as an ex McMuffin maker, uh, they are terrible. They are gross, and I've seen my boss pick multiple up off the floor and give them to people. McGriddles, however, are God's gift to man. Holy mm. shit! Yeah. Should we just stop? filled with syrup? Oh my god! Okay, so everyone, you're either writing a McMuffin or you're writing a McGriddle. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you gave. I'm McGriddle gang. Uh, so like, is McMuffin our term for a regular old MacGuffin, and McGriddle is a term for a MacGuffin that's actually useful in a story? I was gonna say, yeah, uh, useful. Okay. If a MacGuffin is useful, that's when I think it turns from like a MacGuffin to a true artifact, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think through. like should should we define what a MacGuffin is for anyone listening that doesn't know that term? Yeah, sure. Uh no, so, let's make Dean post the definition in the video. <laughs> you want to put me to work? <laughs> for anyone that only listens as a in, as, as it a, as a podcast though. Wow. No. I can't talk tonight. Look it up yourselves, audience. Sorry. Um anyways, yeah, who wants to define MacGuffin? Who has the, the best vernacular for teacher, this? Teacher, teacher, me, teacher, pick me. Go go for it. Yes. Okay, uh, MacGuffin is a basically useless item in a story that is used to simply just move the plot forward. So I'm currently playing Doom Eternal, and I'll probably bring it up a bunch of times because it has such a paper-thin plot. It's based only on items with a skull or lasers in it. And so half the game is you going to specific locations with an I to search for an item that really only moves the plot forward. Like you're trying to uh, kill three hell priests. So you will go get this artifact from this guy, which then gives you the ability to find this artifact from this guy, which will then tell you the location of the priests when doom guy could have just gone on a trip and you know, they could have skipped all those items and he just could have fought the Hell Priest in a bigger level. There was no reason for those multiple artifacts. Those are MacGuffins. Other than the, uh, the that game's absolutely nightmarish slash, like, gorgeous level design. The level designers in the game went fucking ballistic. Yeah, they, mm. like, this is my fourth or fifth time playing through it, so I can really take in how much the items don't matter. But, like, every time you get transported to just, like, literally, like, a monster-making factory on the surface of Mars, and every time it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful in <laughs> and, how gross it all is. And, like, to, to think, to tie into that, when it comes to, like, you know, MacGuffins, like, it, I, I think to me, like, it doesn't really matter how special or how awesome like the world design is and you know not to discredit what you two were just talking about but just in terms of like in terms of weapons like yes your your reasoning for for being there in this world or in this or in this game or in this wherever like something about like having a MacGuffin there like if if it's because of a MacGuffin that you're being taken to this area it just kind of feels a little bit better but i and keep in mind i've only played the first doom so there wasn't a, there wasn't any really kind of like signature MacGuffin that you were looking after. You were just looking for a whole bunch of like, um, like random shit, which doesn't really feel significant. It just opens doors, and it like you either just open doors or you just like that's not really anything special. Right? Since this is very interesting mm. because as someone who's not like a huge video game person, I feel like looking for items and collecting them to move forward is literally the whole point of most video games <laughs> yeah that's what i was about to, to bring up was like a lot of MacGuffins end up just making a plot around a really long and annoying fetch quest mm -hmm. right like in literature or in video games if there's a MacGuffin that people are searching for you've just taken a fetch quest and dragged it out ad nauseum right mm -hmm. even if 
just smaller fetch quests along the way. Every little key, to some extent, could also even be a MacGuffin. Why is this door locked? Well, because you need to go get this key. Why do I need to get this key? So we can showcase this one random arena and make you spend more time in this game, right? This this plays in really well to our prior episode about Elden Ring, because mm. virtually every item in Elden Ring is holistic. There's some reason with the story and with the characters to get that item. But then with Doom, and the reason is because Doom is a 30-year-old series and it's really bunched up in its nostalgia as a 90s shooter, is simply just get key, open door, get key, open door. But with Elden Ring, virtually every key has a like 10 page story around one of the main characters to it. Mm -hmm. Is that where we define like like a, a good MacGuffin versus a bad MacGuffin? If it's like important to the plot, if it has like lore around it that like defines the story, it's good. Whereas if you just have to get it to, to advance, it's bad. That's a good mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Like with if it's an important tool in the context of history, that's one thing. But if it's actively being sought out by, you know, by your protagonist or by your, by your antagonist, I feel like that kind of thing, because I don't know if it's just me and this is maybe just, you know, this is just somewhere where we can go off of, but like, if you are taking a thing, like if you have just like a cool weapon or like a cool artifact in your world, but anyone, but no one's really coming after it, that doesn't really make it a MacGuffin, I don't think. Like, it just makes it a cool part of the world, yeah, but, like, if it's just there, it's just there. Does that make any sense? Like... Yeah. I think by definition, when you're... when, Or at least, you know, how I've kind of, you know, gone off of MacGuffins, it's like, it's, it's the thing that people are active... Like, everyone is actively searching for, right? Like, it's different from, like, a key or, like, some kind of, you know, thing to kind of get from point A to point B. Like, it's the thing that, like, every It drives motivation, basically. I think when uh, you brought up when something simply just exists in the world, if it just exists in the world and doesn't really contribute to the stories or characters or themes, that would be set dressing. Yeah, That's I idea. think like with the topic of MacGuffins, there's like there's this, there's like there's definitely a lot of like a crossover with like other story terms, like they're like like plot cul de sacs and like just like random bullshit. I feel like a the last Star Wars movie had that issue a lot where it had like a bunch of MacGuffins that were sort of MacGuffins and were sort of not MacGuffins and like was just was just like random bullshit that just that were just like different items that appeared. Like yeah, they had that fucking dagger that you had to do a little, yeah. they, they do a little. That fucking dagger was so stupid. <laughs> and the big snake. The big snake. Oh the big, big snake. snake. Yeah. The big underground the, snake. The fucking big snake. The uh the 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 little Jedi triangles. I don't know I, enough about Star Wars lore. Um, an example of set dressing would be all of uh, spoilers for Episode Nine, but all of Emperor Palpatine's uh, weird environment shit on his like kind of Sith home planet, where he's got that big apparatus he's connected to, and then all those old man Snokes in like mason jars, and it's implying that he's this big kind of puppet master of the galaxy, but it also just kind of degrades the whole star wars story because it literally was just this one guy for the last a hundred something years behind the scene with a bunch of mason jars mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh new take palpatine is a moonshiner like this take everyone yeah he's I... blind <laughs> yeah he's um, blind from on, space moonshine on uh on mcguffins and thing one just slightly off kilter is i do like a mcguffin when it's a person sometimes because then it at least has character right and this is, again kind of moves off of weapons and artifacts so i'll be short and quick but the idea of the chosen one as the mcguffin uh is kind of played out if it's your main character however if your main character or your point of view character is guiding said human mcguffin to a location that leads to some nice interplay i always find mm -hmm. i do like MacGuffins that can talk and do things it does a bit more than just you know sit in a briefcase and be wanted it has its own wants itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to well, oh, sorry alex go ahead well i was gonna change the topic oh i just had to think contribute to that for a little bit because um may i yeah 
Okay, so yeah, not to sit on this a little bit too long, but yeah, so Tyler, on your point, there is one example that does that really well, and that is God of War 3. Um, I recently started like rewatching it, and basically, I can spoil this for God of War 3, like Pandora thing, the, the, the woman behind Pandora's box, Pandora herself, is like a living, breathing person, but she is the... Like she, she is the MacGuffin in the story of God of War three, and everyone is going after her. And the fact that, um, the fact that she resembles like a younger woman, um, plays a lot into Kratos' story, especially you know like pre God of War four Kratos, um, and really like like really blends well into the story because not only is it something that is needed for his story, but it's also like it also adds a lot of complexity because then it's like okay yes i need her for the plot but like she also means something you know based off of what it been and it's kind of hard not to get too much into spoilers but just yeah it's it's good that you brought that up tyler because yeah when a, when it's a person that just adds like a whole lot more like conflict i think when it comes to going after something also turns it from a fetch quest into an escort quest. Alex, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't think... Um, I, I had a smooth transition and I lost it. Um, but uh, a, a MacGuffin doesn't necessarily have to be a person to be able to do something. Because, you know, there's the, the concept of sentient items. Why don't we talk about those for a bit? I think that's a fun, fun concept. Uh, so, like, really hard for me not to talk about D&D &D here, um, obviously. It's so fun to be a DM and hand your player a sentient item and then talk in their brain for a while. Really good times. Really but great. the best example of a sentient item I have ever seen is Ash Drinker. Somebody ring the bell. It's Tyler's avatar and name right now. Ding, ding, um, ding. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, Ash Drinker is the best done sentient magic item I have ever fucking seen. She is fantastic. In a book that is like really edgy and really cliche as Empire of the Vampire, Ash Drinker was a very interesting breath of fresh, fresh air. She had personality. She was a solid weapon. She was a sword that killed vampires. Uh, she was kind of useful in her personality because it doesn't have eyes the sword just sort of senses bad things happen and so one of the best abilities she ever has is she'll warn you when someone's coming to stab you and she'll be like look behind you block you idiot um and cute things like that she's also fucking insane okay she talks to the main character, and while he is killing vampires and getting his ass handed to him, she is sing-songing a recipe for potato soup into his brain. I need to read this book. That's awesome. It's fantastic. Ash Drinker is lovely. She's got a stutter because her blade is broken and it's caused her some, like, self-esteem issues. She's Ooh. really interesting and really well done. Plus, and this is just the first book in the series... Because the second book isn't written yet. Hurry the fuck up, Kristoff. Anyways, uh, we don't know where she came from. It's listed a few myths like, oh, found her in the grave of an old king, took her off a dead vampire. The main character himself says, I think at one point, oh, I just found her in a ditch. Um, and she scoffs at him for that because she is like an ancient, powerful sword in the universe's lore. Um, we do find out how she got broken. And it's actually a really interesting scene where she fails as a weapon. And she even apologizes to the main character in some very interesting heartfelt moments later in this, later in the book. Like, Ash Drinker, fantastic. Even as a character, not just a sentient weapon, really well done. And the best example of it I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, to go off of that, then I think that's the... Like, that's the thing when it comes to sentient weapons. Like they're no longer just an item it's a whole personality right so you kind of have to write it a bit differently compared to you you would need to write a sentient weapon a bit more differently compared to just a regular sword because like if you have a named sword right that is you know like sting from lord of the rings like that's one thing but if that if that sword or if that weapon or if that artifact then 
has sentience or if it is like complex enough to be able to communicate to your characters that's a whole different kind of like thing you're basically writing in another character and you shouldn't try to see it as anything other than that like how does this character then fit into the narrative how is it then that's you know how is it that they can change the the how is it that they affect the plot like it's no longer just an item right it's a whole being have you ever played uh shadow <clears throat> shadows of the damned have any of you ever played shadows of the damned oh that's that's a good <laughs> topic for this podcast episode i don't think anyone here knows what you're talking about no i don't exactly what i'm talking about though okay <laughs> Can I say the name? Yeah, d- okay. yeah. Okay, G- Gabe can go off on all this, but I just wanted to give the name. So the item, you're talking about the big boner, right? I'm talking... <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm not fucking up the name or anything. It's literally the big boner. Go next, yeah. Gabe. <laughs> okay. The, the what? The big boner. <laughs> the big boner. So... <laughs> like, a, like a big bone weapon. It is a, it is a, so in Shadows of the Damned, I can't remember the guy's name you play as, it's something, it's something, it's like a really, really generic, uh, la- Latino name, Garcia Hotspur. Um, you play as Garci- Garcia Hotspur and you have a gun that is called the Boner and it is a, it is a gun and it is, a, it is, it has a, it has a skull at the tip of it and the, and I think he refers to himself as the Johnson, but it's all, the gun is also called the Big Boner and he he is a he he just makes innuendos throughout the game. This is I think this is this is a Suda fifty one game. Um, you're you're, you're kind of missing the detail on why it's the big boner. So it is the boner, and his name is Johnson. And then when it gets into into super mode, where it basically turns into like an elephant gun, like it stretches to like seven feet long. Garcia holds it around the waist level, and then it's the big boner. <laughs> and yeah, it's a Suda game. Of course, it would. Suda I has this with for words. Suda has <laughs> wow. this big infatuation with virtually every one of his games where if the character has a weapon, he makes it very clear that this character is being very masturbatory with it. That's why mm-hmm. in No More Heroes you literally like jerk your sword to recharge it because he likes to play around with the idea of power fantasy is masturbatory. So of course the main character's weapon is their phallus that they're just holding in their hand the whole time. Suda51. Interesting, interesting guy. Interesting guy. Mm-hmm. I'd use different words, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Anyways, the big boner, uh, sentient, I'm assuming. It is sentient. He talks to you throughout the game. He ha- he's, he's... Okay, but... <laughs> Can we take a second to imagine having a sentient weapon called the boner (laughs) that talks to you? Hold on, I need to take a call from the boner. (laughs) Hold on, my boner's talking to me. You're what? (laughs) Will you pardon me? I need to go speak with the boner. I hate that this is like the only... I, I don't know enough, like stories that have a sentient objects or i can't think of enough off the top of my head this is like this is like the first thing that comes to my mind and the whole time we've been talking i've been like okay i need to come up with another example i can't <laughs> but I this was, is it this is all i got i was gonna say every zelda game also in the chat i posted the boner because it seems like everyone here is so lost on it it's like a buddy cop type of dynamic between the two of them mm-hmm. uh where like uh Garcia is the straight man, and then Johnson is like the loudmouth. And uh, I was gonna say every Zelda game, literally every Zelda game that has ever existed. But I love the boner so much more because <laughs> aside from like major, uh, aside from a uh, Twilight Princess, virtually every sentient weapon or like key item in Zelda is not that fun. They're just kind of mm-hmm. someone to talk for Link or explain things to Link. But because Shadows of the Dam takes place in Hell, the gun is a demon gun. It knows everything about Hell. It's an expositor as well as like a side partner as well as the comedic relief. <laughs> oh, there's also... Relief is interesting because Ashbringer it's... does fill a similar role. There's also a sentient item in Shadows of the Damned of this goat head that uh, 
that Garcia is chasing after, which is also a MacGuffin, and I think the goat head's pretty funny too. Um, while we're on sentient, does anyone have any other examples before I take another swing at this? Um, go ahead. I'm speechless. <laughs> I have, I have. You've one... killed the host, guys. Yeah. <laughs> It's ha- not hard. I've been dying the past couple of weeks because of this goddamn fucking heat. Oh, anyway, shit. Continue. Sorry, man. Um, I haven't played it, but I know that it is like a sentient item that helps you out throughout the game. Is what's the book's name from Near Replicant, Gabe? I know you've played. Ow! Weiss. Yeah. Fucking, yeah. Yeah. What? Did- I feel so Why stupid. I feel. Like- I feel like I have. I, I feel so stupid. I was. I was gonna say like I, you were coming up with. You were trying to come up with examples. I'm like you played near. I I played near. I did like a two hour breakdown of all of near. I couldn't think of <laughs> <laughs> more vice. Yeah. I thought of the fucking big boner from Shadows of the Dam before I thought of Grimoire vice. Grimoire vice. Yeah. 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 You can take it over from there. I don't know anything about near replicants. So. Uh, it's pretty much like a lot of the same stuff, just like a, you know, different uh, in in uh, in more in some obvious ways. But he's not he's not uh, he's not he's not like he's not a sexual he's not a walking sexual innuendo for one. Um, mm-hmm. Boo! <laughs> Boo! <laughs> Boo! Boo! I say. <laughs> Well, my next topic might rescind that boo, but anyways. Yay. I liked Weiss. I did like Weiss. I truly... I haven't played too much of the original Nears. I did beat it a long, long time ago, but I don't remember much of it. Um, floating book that talks. Wow. Yeah. That's a classic. Also shoots things. He shoots things yeah. and he does, he does all your spells for you. Yeah. Yeah. Which is cool. I really like that. Should get like the weapon design in Mir is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Um, sentient weapons. There is one example that I will touch on because it's a very important one, I think, in our media, and that is a sword called Stormbringer. Anyone heard of Stormbringer? No. Uh-huh. In passing. All right. Yeah. Everyone who reads fantasy should probably know about Stormbringer because it's basically the first sentient sword in our modern media it is based off an old norse one tearfing um in norse mythology but stormbringer is like the quintessential it is a demon in a sword that eats souls and empowers its user if you've ever seen somebody use that they are directly influenced by the original and that is stormbringer um as weapons go edgy you know, talks a lot of doom and gloom because it's a demon, but I digress. You gotta pay homage to the OG in this case. And uh, funny enough, it was based off of uh, theories from Jung and Freud in that the whole point, and this is the author literally being quoted, the whole point of Elric's soul-eating sword Stormbringer was addiction to sex, to violence, to big black phallic swords, to drugs, and to escape. That is why it went down so well in the rock and roll world. So yeah, even back in the OG, apparently, everyone was thinking about dicks. I mean, I feel like that's just true for, like, all of time. (laughs) What Stormbringer from again? Uh, so the series is uh, what's the first one in the book? Da, da, da. The first is the novella, the Dreaming series, and it's collected in the Stormbringer book. Um, <laughs> what's the series called? It's it's mainly with Elric is the name of the emperor that uses it. Where's his book series? <laughs> Who writes these books? Moorcock, Michael Moorcock. Huh. Um, started off in 1961. Yeah. Jeez. I, mm. I watched a video a long time ago about it, but I must not have been paying attention because the guy whose channel I watch does Terry Pratchett stuff, and I thought, oh, it's Stormbringer from the Wheel of Time. And I was like, yeah, that must be that must be what Stormbringer's from. Anyway, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to mention the OG there, because again... Almost any sentient weapon nowadays is based off of Stormbringer. Your mention of 
Norse mythology also reminded me that there is a sentient sword in the Magnus Chase trilogy, Simar Brander or Jack, because it's not a Rick Riordan book without giving weapons silly names. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jack Jack was a fun, fun weapon. I, it's been a while since I read these books. From what I remember, he can like fly around and like do the fighting for the main character. But it comes with like the drawback of even though the main character doesn't actually do the stuff, he still takes like the impact of as if he had done it. So I, I think there's like one scene where the sword like flies up and stabs the giant in the nose, and then Magnus has to is like get no gets knocked out for a while because the sword doing that is basically the equivalent of him climbing up the giant and stabbing him in the nose himself. Interesting. Now that's mm. a neat drawback for a flying sword. Yeah, it was it was well balanced. Um, those those books had a lot of problems, but I actually thought the flying sword was well done. <laughs> kind of a, because like I'm thinking of a fighting style, and fighting style is definitely something I want to talk about in this episode. And, you know how you pick weapons based on it, but it kind of defeats the purpose of having a flying sword because if you have a flying sword, you don't need to block because there's no person on the end of it to stab. But now the flying sword has to block, so that's like a really interesting drawback. Yeah, I mean, well, it's yeah, it's like the the way it works is because Magnus as a character is um not a fighter. Um, like he doesn't like go into battle and like fight with a sword. Um, he actually tends to have like a lot of healing magic, and so the weapon is like the flying sword is basically his way of being able to fight. I think this is like Rick Riordan's way of differentiating this character from Percy who is a sword fighter um but yeah so it's like he releases the sword sword flies around and then as soon as he like grabs the sword again that's when the effects take place ah uh, mm -hmm. so it's not it's not like immediate um but it's not something he can put off either from what I remember yeah just run away from the sword never touch it again bye <laughs> have fun <laughs> bye Jack we'll see you later keep doing what you're doing um, yeah, I'll stop talking about Percy Jackson until a couple weeks from now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 what's happening then? Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, um, I think to not to deviate too much, but just on the topic of like named artifacts and weapons, as it's kind of like a quick side tangent, I thought of like this one really it like her weapons don't necessarily have sentience but they do add a lot to her character and that is Inej from the Six of Crows duology like the fact that all of her daggers and like weapons are basically named after saints just adds so much to Inej's character and I feel like I find like named weapons themselves again to kind of like go on a quick side tangent like add so much to your protagonist like if there is like if like x character is holding something right that just adds like a whole lot of legacy to that character yeah, actually, well, I would like to talk about yeah. named weapons. When, mm -hmm. like, you know, when do you name a weapon in a story? When is it important that a weapon has a name and when is it irrelevant? I think is very interesting. Because mm -hmm. um, you're right, like, a character who has named their weapons, that can tell you a lot about a character. And in Inej's case, you know, it tells you a lot about, like, her faith that she is still, that she has been, like, separated from but still feels, like, attached to. And it also, like, you know, shows her internal conflict, you know, naming weapons that she uses to kill people with after saints. Yeah, is like, that's awesome. You know, first of it's all. a really interesting, like, internal conflict that is then explored in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, I said I'd stop talking about Percy Jackson. I lied. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, you know, in, in the books, Luke's sword is called Backbiter. Mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and this weapon like is very significant because unlike most um, weapons that demigods use, it is able to harm both um, like normal humans and also monsters because it's made up of like a dual material. Um, and it's just like, it's very interesting that it has this name that's so important that like reflects it's like dual nature and reflects Luke's dual nature as both like antagonist and hero and you know also his being a demigod half human half god it's just 
yeah, I don't know. Named weapons are interesting. Mm -hmm. no, Thoughts? I, do, I love I love a good named weapon. Uh, I find sometimes it gets a little egregious. Um, so in Empire of the Vampire, you get a few named swords here and there. It, it, it's always swords in media. We never get like a named axe. Which, whatever, West, I don't care that you're so infatuated with swords. They're not <laughs> the most useful thing in the world, honestly. Um, they're cool. They're cool. Mm -hmm. uh, a mace is a lot more useful in a lot of situations, and a spear is still the best. Uh, I digress. I Let's digress. debate which is the best weapon. <laughs> it's a spear. Kind of it's always though. been a spear. Um, I'm getting off topic. Uh, <laughs> Darth, Darth, Darth Maul sword. No. Illegal. <laughs> Because then you we'll stab, talk, and then we'll you can slash, later. and then we'll in the about... back you got another sword. It's so impractical. Anyways, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> uh, as someone who spins fire staff, yeah, it's so impractical. Um, but but I digress. The one that really got me and really annoyed me was actually Game of Thrones. Because everyone in their mother's fucking sword has a goddamn name. <laughs> and it's, it's too much. It's a lot. Every child basically has a named sword or weapon. Every knight has their special sword or weapon. I, is there I, like a registry where you have to register your sword's name to make sure it's not taken? So is there like a lion claw and then the guy who also wanted lion claw has to be like L-I-0-N claw one like or something like that? Sword? Yeah. The sword registry in a fantasy world just must be nuts. 80 oh, see, bucks per year to renew your though. sword name. Oh my god. See, that's very interesting, though, because, like, I don't remember most of the sword names or, like, who even had a named sword in the show or a book show, whatever, except for Arya, because I remember, like, very specifically the scene where she, like, gets the sword and, like, gives it a name. And it felt, like, like really significant because it, like, you know, built this relationship between her and Jon. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So... Both of John's swords were named Winter, the Executioner's Blade, used by Nedard Stark, is named. I believe uh, the Lannister's sword is named. The Mormont's sword is named. Um, yeah, every family has a named sword, <laughs> at least. Yeah, but but then this is my point, is I only remember one of them, which is interesting, because I felt like that's like one that actually played into the character and whose mm -hmm. meaning had like a significance on like the story and the relationships and the characters. Whereas mm -hmm. the other ones are just like they have names because families have name swords, I guess. <laughs> yeah, same with like, mm -hmm. you know, doing sentient weapons. If you're going to give a sword or a weapon a name, try and make it impactful. Mm -hmm. that'd, be, that'd be a good idea. Yeah. I mean, looking at... Um, I think maybe just looking at Norse myth for a second, and 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 a game that kind of like subsequently ties into Norse myth. So Norse myth, obviously, when you think of like magical weapon, or like like magical weapon or magical item, you obviously think of Mjolnir, for like as Thor's signature weapon. Like that's so synonymous with not just like, with not just Thor himself, but like one of the one of the many things that people know of Norse myth is Thor's mighty hammer, and. That in itself, like, based on its lineage, based on its power, based on, like, cer like certainly how influential it is in the myth, like, it's awesome to see thing. It's awesome to, like, like, y you can kind of, like, associate an entire, like, mythology with, like, a single weapon. Or, like, see how that, in like, that one weapon fits into, like, everything. And that's so cool to see. And, and to kind of like talk a little bit more about Norse myth weapons specifically in a game that is set in Norse myth God of War again <laughs> so you have you have um you have the Leviathan axe which is Kratos's signature weapon and it's so fucking cool just how immediate like because because with God of War like everyone associated Kratos with his chained blades but in this in this reboot how familiar people get with the leviathan axe and how like how fun it is to use how like how fun the combos are like its design and and it's just and how its design changes like as the weapon like as you you know as you level up the weapon it's not only very synonymous with or it's not only very like you know in like in character like 
on brand, I think, with like God of War because you could always like you know progress your weapons, but it just adds so much. Um, it adds so much lineage to like Kratos's Kratos' story as well as like the world around him because you know for those who haven't played a God of War spoilers, um, the Leviathan Axe belonged to Kratos' wife and Atreus' mom, Faye, and as a gift from as a gift from Faye to Kratos was that axe and there's so much more lore to that axe than is first kind of initially thought of and that i think like make like it, it makes sense that that weapon is named because there's just so much to it right and i i think maybe as like a counterpoint like whereas the leviathan axe has a lot of lineage and a lot of name behind it one area that i personally feel is or like one game where i think doesn't really understand how to properly name things all the time is Skyrim. My second favorite game ever. <laughs> so where where it names Sky like where Skyrim names their items correctly is the Daedric artifacts. The um like the Daedric artifacts are, you know, obviously for those who have played it's like very special items. Like um there's 17 of them. They're all uniquely designed and you know scale with you basically the problem that i have though with naming weapons is in some of the more radiant items that you get so like okay you become thane of white run here's a generic steel sword with a random enchantment or with a weak enchantment you become thing you become like you're being recruited into the thieves guild here's some generic like thing or no you become you become a nightingale here is like here is this interesting armor but then on the flip side, you helped complete this. You helped complete this like awesome quest. Here's a generic item. What? Here's a generic item with a name to it. I'm like, what? I do agree. They kind of like they littered enchantments in Skyrim way too much, especially with named artifacts. Yeah, like it. Yeah. It feels special when you get a Daedric artifact. Like it's uniquely designed. It's it's. Cha like its enchantment is unique to its weapon you don't really see any other kind of thing like it um and you have to go through a pretty interesting like quest to get that item but wherein and and that's not to say that like skyrim's like naming system is completely bad like i'm not criticizing it like that but just when it comes to like an like an open world video game like skyrim like it's good to have that balance between like it it's good to have like named items to give you something to like you know fight for but if if they're just tossing around like a whole bunch of generic items with interesting names behind it it's like eh, like what's this one thing like what's this one i think it was this like one woodcutter's axe i think that has like an enchantment to to like you know to like do extra damage to animals but it's just a generic woodcutter's axe and i'm like well that's fucking boring <laughs> mm. Um, two quick notes on what you're talking about, because I obviously play a lot of video games. Uh, the thing that makes the Daedric artifacts great as well, they are present in almost every single Elder Scrolls game, and they all require a unique quest. They've always had pretty much the same enchantment going back games and years and years, and lots of lore behind them, so it's great. Uh, I have a problem with the Leviathan's Axe, though, because I'm going to ruin its name for you. As someone who has, you know, oh no, crosses on his I, body. I never noticed this. What? Oh no, I I know where you're going. I just do I you? don't know how I I. Okay, you you do it. I'll I'll you go. You do go. You know. Okay. The yeah. Mythology of I'm, the word Leviathan. I'm a big I'm a big mythology and religion head, and somehow I never noticed this. I've given so much flack to the other God of Wars, and I loved God of War Four so much. I somehow didn't notice this, and my my brain has been splattered all over this room for how hard my mind just got blown. Uh, Leviathan is actually a Jewish word. It has nothing to do with <laughs> Norse mythology at all. Leviathan is a giant sea beast in Jewish mythology, nowhere near Norse. And I have no idea why the Leviathan's axe is named the Leviathan's axe. I was wondering well, about that. Stupid. I was like, that's a weird, that's a weird name choice. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Like, well, that's there is stupid. crazy serpents and stuff in Norse mythology that you could have based it off of. 
but Leviathan is very specifically Jewish before it was adopted into Christianity. Um, never touched ah, North. There's also a series of worlds, one specific realm based around ice. So they weren't like pining for something specific to do with the water or ice. They had so much to draw from and they chose one specific mildly famous Jewish monster, which has like slight relation to the water. I my my mind has been blown. Thank you, Tyler. It's amazing. Ah, uh, yes, I am also a theology head. I have it cut into my body, so yeah, I know about kind, the Leviathan. Kind of same. That's awesome. Hmm. Religious tattoo gang. Hey. hey. Scarification, please. Tattoos are so paltry to me nowadays. Wait, you got um, scars? Like, uh, scarification? I'll show you later. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sweet. Um, but anyways, yes, just wanted to talk about named weapons in that regard. Because I love the word Leviathan, but we got to mm -hmm. know its meaning, right? And that yeah. goes back to giving items legacy. The reason the Elder Scrolls ones are so good is because they have legacy. You got to know the words you're using. You can't go and name something in Latin just because it sounds cool and not look up the proper Latin vernacular of what this word means in this order, as I have made the mistake of a million goddamn times. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Hmm. Anyway, named weapons. I suck at naming weapons. I usually don't. I'll be honest, I don't use much like magic weapons or weapons in general in my storytelling. Most of my characters suck and they die. When I was... Uh, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I was trying to brainstorm weapons before this episode, and if we're talking about items with legacy, there's kind of this big issue I have, because I'm not a traditional fantasy reader i have a lot of more experience with like comics and surreal fiction and one that i've seen really big in the manga section and it flooded over in the 2000s to virtually all comics is uh let's call it like piggybacking legacy in a name and it all started in like 70s and 80s manga just heaping handfuls of american culture into their stories because the authors liked them. And the most obvious one, which I think kind Good of protects... Hey! This guy knows what's up. <laughs> uh, Joe Just Bizarre Adventure, for that one person yeah, in the know, back, yeah. living under a rock, has virtually every single character from the 1800s in, call, uh, in like, Cowboy America to 2010's Japan to Victorian England, named after 80s rock stars. So you have a ancient Aztec superhuman called ACDC. You have That's a awesome. you have a cowboy named Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. You have a series of just nonsensical names that all play into JoJo's like Vogue model rock star aesthetic. And that and a bunch of other series took that in spades and it kind of spread out to a bunch of other pieces of pop culture where you'll just have like characters randomly named things for no reason the one that's annoyed me the most recently which plays a lot more into this with like fantasy weapons and such is they finally did an anime adaptation on netflix of bastard which was a really big 70s fantasy manga but like the main character who's an evil wizard is named like Dark Schneider, which is like I think the guy from maybe like Black Sabbath. Don't quote me on that. But like there's the dark wizard Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> there is a motorhead golem. And it's all just a bunch of rock references that don't have any reason to be in a fantasy setting. And it makes the whole thing feel so paper thin. Because there's no relation between all these things. It's just rock star, rock star, rock star. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I noticed recently, this is sort of getting off topic, but like, have you ever noticed how many like anime have Jack the Ripper in them for like no reason? <laughs> there's, there was a really good forum post I once saw, or like a like a thread where they were just trying to go through like everywhere that Nobunaga has been thrown into an anime for no good reason, where it's like Jack the Ripper, Nobunaga, uh, in... Th there's, like, very certain 
historical figures that just get completely wrapped up in anime uh sub like anime circles for some reason right it's now mm-hmm. it's uh right now it's i think his name's conwin oh what was his name uh right now he's in Kongming, there we go. He's an ancient Chinese, or I don't even know if he's ancient. It was during the War of the Three States, but like he's a he's a Chinese strategist, and he's been just randomly thrown in like four or five anime in the last few years. There's literally one out right now. It's awesome. It's called Ya Boy Kongming, and he gets transported to modern day Japan and becomes an idol manager. Oh my god! Oh my it's, god! Anyway, it has nothing to do with topic, but yeah, uh-huh. yeah, it's super off topic. But I get what you mean, where they kind of just mess around with the legacy of a famous person to give or legacy weapons. to their worlds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or weapons. Like the amount of times I've seen like Excalibur thrown into things too. Oh Not even god. just like anime, but just like in general, people always just be like, "Ah, Excalibur, a name with a history." Mm-hmm. So. Can we, and talk about can we talk about Excalibur for a second? We can talk about Excalibur. Yeah. Because we've talked about Mjolnir, which is Norse, right? Let's talk about ancient British Isles myth and Excalibur. Um, Excalibur is kind of, uh, yes, I remember that. Thank you for judging <laughs> up my PTSD. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. He's the best character in anything ever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyways you, y'all make me never want to watch anime again i'll be honest um so excalibur very interesting its powers are never really stated it is often seen as a MacGuffin. who uses a sword to choose a king that doesn't seem like a very stable situation for a monarchy but uh interestingly enough it was always toted that it is a sword that could cut really well that never lost an edge and historically we we've, we've never found excalibur we don't know what sort it is but given the time period and the technology at the time uh people think excalibur did exist and what excalibur was was a steel sword as opposed to a rough cold iron sword which was the technology available to most of the british isles at the time and they think it was probably left over from some Roman or Gallic invasion, if I remember correctly. And steel would almost seem like magic back then. It always keeps an edge. It never breaks. It's light. It's sharp as hell. And to me, that makes an almost interesting magic item, something that is just a little bit more than mundane. You know what I mean? Because facing that on the battlefield, it could shatter other swords, especially like I said, cold iron ones, which were very brittle. So if you go to block and suddenly your sword is shattered and your general's dead because this guy just cut his sword, that's magical, right? Yeah. And I love a bit of knowledge about like what the real Excalibur could have been. This is, this is kind of a blanket statement on that, but I love any type of myth, mythological or biblical story that is clearly just that initial interpretation of this item is like brought by the gods or as magic because it is a slightly better form of technology. Mm-hmm. So like the, mm-hmm. the Hebrew God can be defeated by steel, right? Or was it iron at the time? Because whatever was the strongest metal at that point, there was a new one that came in and the enemies of the Hebrew people were using them in their chariots. And there's a Bible story about how these chariots were basically killing God because the people of God could not defeat these items uh there's old war stories about greek fire which was like very old primitive napalm and they bring up how it was like dragon's fire or some greek equivalent they it was like a creature was spewing fire forth for the greeks yeah my little yeah. bint on excalibur and the myths that spawned from it because yeah i do agree i love uh i love explaining myth away because i am a hardcore cynic and skeptic <laughs> As well, we now that we're, we're on the topic of things like Greek fire, why don't we talk about some, you know, artifacts and magical items that aren't weapons? Um, uh, Tolkien, what the fuck do the rings of power do, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> the one turns skies invisible? S- sweet. W- what do the rest do? They make you evil? How? 
No, no explanation? Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Is Tolkien. there no explanation in the books? None. Oh my god. I mean, I, it's like a metaphor. It's like a metaphor for something, right? It's how I, I don't know what probably metaphor. is. Yeah, Society. Tolkien. Didn't Tolkien say specifically he doesn't like using his writing for metaphors? Uh, yeah, I'll take your word for it. Yeah, but <laughs> he he tirated most of his life. But come on, you can read things in Lord of the Rings. You yeah. you can read how Lord of the Rings represents certain parts of a man who grew up on the German side of World War Two. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, I mean, like it, it's affected by his life and like the things he believed, but that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean you have to read into it and be like, ah, the whole book is an allegory for war. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I, I would agree. I am a, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the death of the author. So, like, a book is what you read, no matter what. And I do believe that the Rings of Power are analogous to either greed or political power corrupting people. It makes sense and, for greed, yeah. Considering yeah, how, you know, in in Lord of the Rings, you know, there's always the search for just the one, right? Yeah, in you know. A MacGuffin that does things sort of, kind of, but I definitely mm -hmm. think like they're presented as more artifacts than MacGuffins. And if I can go Lord of the Rings a little bit further, we have the Silmarils from the Silmarillion, which are not referenced in the Lord of the Rings at all. Um, again, a bit of a MacGuffin, but also a bit of an artifact because of how they're tied into the lore, being crystallized forms of the lights of the first tree that spawned light on Middle Earth. Like, these things were deep and powerful, and everybody sought them. And each different Silmaril has its own unique story of being sought and eventually lost, um, as all of them were. Uh, all also related to some big prophecy about the Silmarils as well, might I say. I love the Silmarils as both MacGuffin and Artifact, because I say MacGuffin, their powers aren't ever fully explained. Once again, thank you, Tolkien. Mm -hmm. May I um, May I rant about something? <laughs> Go for it. If it's relevant. Uh, no, no. Yes, magical items. Uh Let's talk about the horrible MacGuffins that were in the Transformers Bay movies. Uh, cube. Hmm? Cube. Yeah, I, cube. I would, say, I would say it's kind of impressive at the power of those items to rewrite the entire world history each yeah. new movie. I think that's yeah. impressive. You have... <laughs> You have Cube that gives life to thing that gives life to Transformers, but also kills Megatron. You have the the fucking what is it called? The Matrix, I think. Where the paperweight? A, yeah, the paperweight where you where it harvests the energy of stars, but also brings Optimus back to life. Then you have what the fuck was the MacGuffin? What the fuck I, was Excalibur? It's gonna like one, we right? know what the fucking MacGuffin was in Transformers Three. <laughs> You think I know anything about Transformers? No, I no. I'm just saying, like, there's there's some MacGuffin in that movie where it's like, oh, I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring Cybertron to Earth, <laughs> and then you have, and then you have like in the fourth movie, the like the one tactical bomb that makes more transform. These are stupid movies. <laughs> is not Earth Omnicron or Unicron? Wasn't that the thing in like the last movie? Yeah, that was, yeah. Supposedly, so they were like, "Oh, we need to." <laughs> we need so the third movie, the whole MacGuffin is that like we have to make. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna terraform the Earth to make it a Transformers planet, and but then like in the fifth movie, it is already a Transformers planet secretly. Yeah. So. Okay. Th so quick rant about that, basically over. But yeah, just <laughs> magical items in the Transformers universe make, or in at least in the Bay universe, make no fucking sense. And I Are not. You? Hey, you I'm want not... to talk about a, a MacGuffin that doesn't make any goddamn sense? Let's. <laughs> Anyone here play Kingdom Hearts? Can I? Oh, oh I was going to be one of my weapons. Shit. Um, <laughs> I wanted to say on the Transformers thing, it is a beautiful thing about the Bay movies where they all barely make sense together. Like for Michael Bay movies, they work well enough as a coherent story through all five, but it's literally just that one item every single time that shows that these are not coherent yeah. like all of them basically make sense sam witwicky and the robots and the robots are fighting robots whatever and then mark Wahlberg for a bit but like each time they bring in this item 
it then throws a wrench perfectly like gambit throwing a card every single time it throws a wrench in the machine and blows it up all five times and that's that's a beautiful thing to fuck it up that perfectly each time yeah. the more i learn about transformers always against my will the more <laughs> i i have to go what is the appeal in these again I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing. The more I learn about this Transformers guy, the more I don't care for. <laughs> no, literally. What the there... fuck is going on in Transformers? I, I just watch it for. Products. I just watch it for product placement. But yeah, Kingdom Hearts doesn't know anything yeah. about Kingdom Hearts. I, I love how. Are Kingdom Hearts? I don't think Kingdom Hearts knows about Kingdom Hearts because like the whole no. the, the first game, you're like, oh, we gotta we. We're Kingdom Hearts. We got to get through Kingdom Hearts. And Kingdom Hearts is be Kingdom Hearts is blah. Kingdom Hearts is this. Kingdom Hearts is that. And then they they get to the end of the game and it's like, oh, Kingdom Hearts is is the is this big door, and it goes to Kingdom Hearts. And then we got to oh, Sora's got this little key in his heart. We got to get it out so we can go to Kingdom Hearts. And then it opens Kingdom Hearts the door. The game. The name of Kingdom Hearts is this door. And then in the second game, it's the moon. This guy doesn't give a fuck. He just changes it completely without without any what? any warning. Yeah, yeah, in the, in Kingdom Hearts, like the first game, Kingdom Hearts is like a big door that you that you enter to go to Kingdom Hearts, so it's both a door and a place that you get to. And then in the second game, Kingdom Hearts is the moon, and there's no, <laughs> it's not in, in any okay, sense addressed. Also, which game is the second game? Because these games oh, are that's a great very question. confusingly named. Uh, <laughs> I think they're very... Because there's like Kingdom Hearts, and then there's like Kingdom Hearts like 1.5, and then there's like a Kingdom Hearts 3. I don't know all the Kingdom Hearts games. There's, there's, there's Kingdom there's Hearts 358 yeah. over two days. There's... Michael I think there's... Paul Everest. <laughs> I think there's Everest doesn't know this. Everest played them all, and he doesn't know it. Oh, he knows fantastic. like he knows the key points about as much as me. I think there's eight of them. Uh, yeah, the best I could describe it is if anyone here's had a fever dream, like when you are like on death's door style sick and you go to bed and there's like five words repeating in your head if as long as those words are like key kingdom heart soul and body you probably dreamed the story of kingdom hearts before where it's just anyway, like what it's just like a hundred characters with i don't know how to explain this story there's a hundred characters so let's not try we don't have the time to yeah. get into kingdom hearts in this episode <laughs> cool weapon design because it looks so, like a key. Yeah. It's yeah. There's play. lots of them. The, mm -hmm. They all look like keys. Yeah. I always like the keys. For fighting. Key blades. Mm -hmm. My favorite is uh, is Cloud Strife's Keyblade in one of the spinoffs. Because he rides a motorcycle. So it looks like a car key blade. That's a good idea. <laughs> That's amazing. I hate yeah. that. I hate all of it. It's got bandages too. <laughs> oh, now I hate it. You can't be edgy unless your sword has bandages. I'm sure that's really helpful when you're trying to fight. My sword is injured. <laughs> <laughs> My sword needs bandages. Please, he's bleeding. <laughs> okay, now, a sword that bleeds would be pretty edgy. TBH. TBH oh, so sword. You soul totally edge. don't have one of those in your in one of your yeah. universes, somewhere, right, Tyler? I don't! I actually, like I said, I do not design many weapons, and when we get to, like, my written example, you'll see that I really don't design many weapons. But, if we're going back to artifacts momentarily, I did come up with a quick example of a really good artifact, in my opinion, and it functions as a functional, useful MacGuffin, and that is in at least the first mummy movie and i can't remember much of the second uh the book of the dead that they use like mm -hmm. it actually does things mm -hmm. people actually read from it people chase it around it's a fetch quest but it's interesting it's got quite a bit more personality there's a couple switcheroos in there a few realizations for it and that one for being an artifact is very enjoyable in comparison to a lot of just sought after MacGuffins, like say the one ring Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now, as much as it is colonial and, you know, very wrong with actual Egyptian mythology, I fucking digress. Yeah. It can be interesting and still quote unquote problematic. Yeah. 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 Artifacts, jazz hands. Mm -hmm. Any other fun ones anyone wanted to bring up? Uh, to slightly backtrack on the 
on the bleeding swords thing i really like any type of um i love series and it's a really like recent thing especially in video games to have an item forged from uh like characters in the world so i was showing dean this last time but i have the monster hunter bible and it's like Mm -hmm. every single weapon every single a uh, piece of armor and they're all made from items you'd pick up off the monsters so you have dragon scale armor you have dragon swords uh specifically thinking of the bleeding items there was like in my head was just a lot of the souls items dark souls bloodborne has weapons that are made from like fingers and nails and teeth of the creatures you fight mm-hmm. very viable oh, very fun correct. to have, have like I feel like there's something very interesting about having a character who can, like, like make their own weapon in a way. And, you know, like, you know, if you're using, like, a dragon tooth dagger or something like that, it's like, yeah, maybe you, you fought a dragon and now you have a weapon because of it. Like, that's always so interesting. Mm-hmm. Again, it adds a bit of a bit of legacy to the weapon. You went through this ordeal, you got this weapon from it. It's a bit more... Mm-hmm tangible than say getting gold for killing the dragon right Mm -hmm. and yeah yeah, i mean like to kind of go off of that the a good example that i can see is god of war again (laughs) yeah so yeah oh yeah so uh in god of war 4 with atreus's bow specifically you have two different enchantments to it you start off you start off with just no enchantments to the weapon, but then over the course of the game, you get two that are not just cool for things. Like, it's not just a cool, like, you know, plot beat, but at the same time, it's very useful for exploring the world, for, you know, defeating enemies, obviously. And it just adds, like, a lot more fun without ever really thinking of it like that. Like, it's not... You, do, you don't have to, like, press a whole bunch of buttons to kind of get it. It's just instant, almost. And... Like, the fact that it adds to, you know, the fact that it adds a lot to not just, like, you know, not to the gameplay, but also, like, Atreus' confidence um, and his abilities, like, very cool, I think. Uh, I have an interesting note. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Mine's kind of a farther backtrack, but we were talking about the legacy of weapon names, and I was thinking about a point... uh, alex said at the beginning about having all special weapons or no special weapons probably the only thing i can contribute to this like fantasy novel conversation is berserk i'm a big fan of berserk it's the only like lay uh cross not crossover but like overlap of comic books and like old school kind of fantasy and i do love how virtually nothing in berserk has a special name they're like the characters do have titles of course because they're knights they're kings but the weapons themselves don't usually have special names except for the main leads lead character guts has a sword called the dragon slayer which is an item it's it's a large sword that is more comparable to like a hunk of steel like a big slab um and it's known as the weapon with such like weight and mass that if you can pick it up you can cut a dragon's head off with it and it gives a lot of gravity to the weapon that it's the only weapon in this fantasy world known as a specific title yeah no i think that's that's definitely a really big thing is if you have one weapon with a title um it's like it feels grand whereas if every single weapon has a title or a name it's just kind of just like okay they're all named it kind of like it loses its weight you know Mm -hmm. um so quick uh point on that one because there are quite a few named weapons in empire of the vampire you don't meet too too many of them but you know that they are named and how it's explained is that when a smith makes a weapon for one of these vampire slayers they always name it so like there is actually a lot of named weapons which is fine for world building, but it's not like, and then Geralt slashed with Ash Drinker and Gabriel slashed with Lion <laughs> and Jeremy over here slashed with Frank every 10 seconds. You only get typically Ash Drinker doing things, which mm-hmm. is a good way to do it in my opinion. But uh, a note on what you said, Dean, which is something we haven't necessarily touched on. 
in relation to magic weapons is kind of the we touched a bit on like how they're made if they're made of monster bits or out of things in the universe but about enchanting because enchanting is a word that's tossed around a lot with magic weapons like this sword is enchanted in video games there are sometimes enchantment mechanics uh but sometimes that process isn't necessarily fully explained and i find when you say oh a sword is enchanted it's sometimes kind of a cop-out right like how did it get this way oh it's an enchanted ma blade made by a mage fucking how i'm a hard magic dark fantasy nut you've got to give me specific please and thank you mm -hmm. um, which is a problem i do have yeah. with a lot of magic weapons and even artifacts in media is it's enchanted. Great. Cool story, bro. Wanna Did wanna elaborate? <laughs> yeah, please. So, something? <laughs> I, anything? So in terms of enchantments, like if you're enchanting a weapon, you're giving it magic, and magic in itself is very, you know, obviously hard to write sometimes. If especially if you don't know how to write magic, because you need to have some kind of cap to it. It can't just be all powerful because then it's not even that fun right like and and to kind of an obscure example but to to talk about enchantments in minecraft you may have an incredibly powerful weapon but your weapon may still break and you may have like this like thing you may have like you can put a whole bunch of enchantments on your thing but there's still a cap to that and you're the one who's doing all the work. You're ha you are the one who has to like enchant the weapon yourself. And there's always like a price for it. It's not just easily set. It. It's not just, you know, it's not just like a few like lapis and then that's it. Like you need like experience levels. You need like a good number of lapis too. Like I can't believe I'm saying this, but like the fact that Minecraft's like enchanting system is just very, very complex <laughs> is fucking awesome because again, to kind of counteract like Skyrim, you just need a soul gem which you can pickpocket from anyone really if you're if you're just trying to take it the easy way so you can pickpocket a soul gem and through and through cheats you can just and you know through like through exploits of the game you can uh, you can you can have like a level like a, like a level one sword with like a thousand flame points that doesn't make sense yeah another thing if, since we've brought up minecraft that I think, like, is kind of frustrating when you're playing, but it's actually pretty good from, like, a mechanic standpoint. Is like, in Minecraft, I know there's certain enchantments that can't be on the same item. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of, like, you know, limits what a certain item can do. Because you don't want to have, you know, one magical item that can do literally everything, right? Because mm -hmm. then it gets overpowered yeah and so you know when we talk about magic we talk about like you need to have limits you, like you need to know what the rules are there needs to be consequences for like doing certain things all that and that applies to like magical items too and weapons like you, if you have a sword that can like you know set everything on fire but also it can freeze everything it touches and also it flies and also it I don't know, steals people's life forces. At a certain point, you're just kind of like, okay, yeah. At this what, point, what the else sword can, can just do? do everything, I guess. Yeah, it's like the like the Superman problem. Yeah, basically, yeah. That's a really good way of looking at it. Yeah, actually, because again, with magic, if if it's so broad that it could literally be applied to anything, then what's the point of even having tension, right? Like, there has to be some kind of limit. Especially when it comes to magical weapons and artifacts. Because, again, if if this thing is so... Like, you can have it be a powerful item, sure. But you just can't have it be so powerful that there's suddenly just no plot. Right? Because then it just yeah. doesn't make any sense. Like, everyone's gunning for it. But then... That's it. Like, you don't really kind of explore, like, how it affects your characters. How it affects the world. It's just this big, yeah. powerful, dumb thing. And actually, um, since we're talking about limits too, this kind of reminds me of the conversation we were having in back in the the Shadow Hunters episode, when Tyler, you were talking about like the the mortal instruments as like items, um, and like the impact that they have on the world. 
Yeah, the the culture specifically of the shadow hunters as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that you don't have like you know, Clary doesn't like get the mortal cup in the first book and then can use it whenever she wants for like the rest of the series. Um, you know, like the cup is there and it's important and it's like an artifact, but it's not just like something that can be overused. And so mm -hmm. I think especially if you're going to have a very very powerful item that can do a lot of things, there needs to be limitations on like who can use it and when and how and all that stuff. And also, yeah. also since we're still here, um, again, if magical items like this exist in your world, they're gonna, they're probably gonna be important and like the world building should reflect that in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like yeah. that, again, it's the same thing with my complaint and, and use of magic systems. Y you can't, you can't, sp hmm. You can't kitchen sink it and not explain it. Know what I mean? You can't just throw a magic system in or throw enchanted items in and not have a good reason for that. Things do. Like, I know there's a deep reason in Elder Scrolls as to why magic even exists in the first place, but you don't feel any of that in Skyrim. In Skyrim, enchanting is just a gamey mechanic. It doesn't have any import. Right. Yeah. Whereas in Minecraft, a game that doesn't really have necessarily lore, the slog you have to go through makes the enchantment important to you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and it's interesting to talk how we say legacy of weapons and magic weapons. And then we go to Minecraft, which has no such damn thing. But you kind of make your own in Minecraft. Like yeah, you were I'm saying, right. Alex, about making your own weapons in that you made this pickaxe. You're digging in a mine and suddenly you realize you're down to just the barest scrap of durability. And so you run up and you repair it and you've saved it mm -hmm. this time. And that creates your own story with the item. Yeah. And yeah. if nothing else, it just gives you purpose, right? Like to add on to that, like you made the pickaxe, you got the materials you fought, like for a diamond pick, you obviously needed to go like super deep into the ground to find your diamonds, right? You might have needed to waste like hours trying to do that. Same thing with all of the other items like it. Minecraft is so like it's really special in the regard that like you you work for everything that you have, especially when it comes to your weapons, like fighting the Ender Dragon, fighting, fighting the Wither. I think trying to survive the Warden now, but like all of like all of the major achievements that you have in Minecraft, you do yourself. It feels earned like you feel like you've accomplished a lot when you have, you know, done these things yourself. And that account that accounts for the magic system too, because like, or like, you know, the enchanting, because again, like you have to find the resources. And especially if you want specific thing, if you want specific enchantments, you often have to cycle through different, like different, like, like a different, I think like you have to what you have to like, replace your enchantment table, realign your book some way. Like if you want a lot of enchantments, you obviously need like a lot of like, you know, library, you need like a lot of bookshelves, like there's a lot to it, but it feels earned. It feels like, you know, your, your level five sharpness sword came after you put in a lot of work to get there after you've earned it basically. Yeah. And also as a result of that, you know, if you lose those items, like, you know, either because it breaks or I don't know, a creeper sneaks up behind you and explodes all your stuff. And you have to like run back across the map just to watch everything disappear before you can grab it. You know, it, it Things just gave sucks. everyone PTSD. Mm -hmm. By the You're way, welcome. Yeah, that hurts. <laughs> I remember falling in the lava in the Nether. Yes, I remember. Thank you. I'm crying. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you put in all this effort, and then you lose the things, and it it sucks. You know, you feel like connected to those items because you had to put in the work to get them and you know that it's going to take a lot of work to get back to where you were <laughs> as a note for all for all writers out there play minecraft you'll understand Apparently. how important it is to balance your weapons <laughs> yes the the reco today is play minecraft damn it <laughs> okay i have a like while we're still talking about like enchantments and probably and probably like you know limiting your weapons i have something that i want to bring something up that i'm curious about like we talked about it a little bit earlier but i since i have no knowledge on star wars um lightsaber giant oh, yeah. laser cuts off limbs why it's variants <laughs> so many variants um so like lore reasons as a huge fucking star wars buff 
uh, before they just destroyed the cannon, thank you, Mouse, I will not go on a rant today. Um, the cannon was actually good with how the crystals were formed and how it relates to the human being and how they're basically like little sentient crystals to some extent and how they relate to the living force as a concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, it's all done very well in-universe if you read the extra books and go the extra mile in in the canon. Um, and each lightsaber is specific to the individual because they also made that. That's a huge part of becoming a Jedi is making your own lightsaber. And some of the variants are stupid. The, the cross guard is dumb. I'd be the first to admit that. The light whip, pretty stupid. Uh, Darth Maul's blade, the dual-ended saber... It has lore implications, like they, they explain it away in the lore. Fighting with two sabers is explained fine in the lore and stuff like that. One that no one ever talks about, though, is one in a very little known novel that happens, ugh, I want to say 10 years after episode six, when Luke is setting up his actual Jedi school on one of the moons of Yavin, not what they show in the movies. Uh, one of his pupils turns kind of evil, just kind of, and he creates his own lightsaber. And this lightsaber special effect is very different from what we see in any of the movies. It can switch its lengths because it has two different crystals inside of it. This completely changes the fighting style on the fly of the person you're fighting. And that, from like a martial arts perspective, suddenly your enemy's sword shrinks a little bit and they dive in for a close attack or it gets longer as they step away so that you have to hold them at bay with a different fighting style. That was very interesting, very well thought out in the lore and made for some very interesting dynamic fights as opposed to it has a cross guard. That's really cool, actually. Yeah, That's actually a reminds me of... Um, a manga that I really like called Black Cat. Uh, the main antagonist has a sword that's like invisible, um, but the blade can like just like the blade is invisible. The hilt is visible. It's a very weird sword, um, but like the the blade can like extend in length. Um, but it's also like it's invisible because it's like tied to the guy's soul, um, and so he can like use his willpower to make the blade longer so he can be standing like across the room from someone and, like hold out his hilt and like the blade gets long enough to cut them from like across a room it's yeah stuff like that is very interesting and again ties it to a fighting style which do we have any more comments on star wars by the way i could i could go for years on um not the serious lightsabers <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> we don't, we don't like, need to talk about Star Wars that much. <laughs> I, I'd say <laughs> to get my own. Star Wars episode. We've done it. I get, I get one quick one. Uh, in Star Wars Visions, there is a 10 saber lightsaber that is shaped like a parasol. And I love any lightsaber that has a motor in it to make the blade spin. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> what? Yeah. 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 So Hold picture. On. No, I need, I need this. Hold on. <laughs> Picture like a weed weed whacker, and there's this big history of random lightsabers in new canon and old canon that have like a lawnmower style to them. So Asajj Ventress kind of has it. She has a a a, ch a chancra, I think is what they're called, which they're these like disc blades, and hers has a motor, so she's holding the blade, and there's a disc around her hand with a lightsaber on each side. So picture Darth Maul spinning the lightsaber, but instead he's holding his hand out flat with the blade yeah, rotating. It. Yeah, that's the one right there. Oh, that's and fucking cool, actually. It looks so impractical. It, it makes sense in the aesthetic of the episode, because that episode is based on old Akira Kurosawa films. That's why it's in black and white and all grainy. So he looks like a like just Japanese vagabond carrying a parasol, but he's actually holding his lightsaber over his shoulder. And then when the parasol extends and starts rotating, it's a parasol made of like lightsaber plasma. Ah, so um, this is a great segue. I love exactly. that. Oh my God, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Because um, one thing that like I've wanted to talk about for this episode, Alex, if you don't mind. I don't know what you're go for it. <laughs> Say, or... am I allowed to segue? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't want to talk about Star Wars anymore. Go ahead. <laughs> Good. Is making a fighting style and a weapon fit to the character? And this doesn't even need to be magic weapons. 
truthfully. But when you design a character or have a character in media that you like that has a weapon, what is it that ties them to that weapon? Does the weapon make sense for their personality? Like, a pacifist should probably have a weapon that doesn't cut people open, because a pacifist with a sword doesn't really make sense. Why does someone who's described as an angry, vicious barbarian use a shield and defend themselves? Like, those are complete opposites. But when you find that weapon character pairing and combination, especially when paired with a, like, very good fighting style that's based in real-world arts or, like, good fight choreography, that can become very nice Mm -hmm. um i do have a minor example of some very interesting weapon design that sort of fit the characters and this is a very terrible uh show called ruby oh yeah ruby here Mm -hmm. yeah Um, the the weapon design off the walls insane but the weapons do kind of fit the characters personality wise with keeping distance and speed and they play off the strengths of the characters as listed within the lore and uh, setting of the world it's kitchen sink as ruby is uh, i did still like the weapon design and how they related to the characters mm-hmm. her fucking scythe is so cool i know it's scythes so are impractical but they're so cool and they're, hers so is cool. so cool oh yeah scythes are <laughs> scythes are awesome i can't wait to talk about the one that i've drawn up <laughs> And and it fits because, like, it even has history with her because her uncle taught her to use it. And isn't that her mother's or something? I can't remember. Like, either she made it or it's someone in her family. So the weapon has has legacy, right? And in a world where there are these horrible monsters and people use these crazy ass weapons and have these superpowers, like, it fits. It's still cohesive enough, right? And it fits the character. You don't picture Ruby without the damn side, it is that integral to the character. So that's that's my example of good weapon design relating to a character, and not even that, magical. Like, that doesn't even just apply to, like, Ruby as the character specifically. I feel like that applies to, like, pretty much all of the characters in that show. Mm-hmm. Is like, mm-hmm. their weapons are part of their design. They, like, fit yep. their fighting style. They, like, fit their aesthetic and their personalities. Like, they... Like, I'm like, I can picture the main four with, like, all of their weapons so easily because they're yep. so integral to the show and mm-hmm. the characters. It, One thing they did real well. It's yeah. an absolute shame that, like, the story of Ruby is not half as good as the visual storytelling and its characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the fight choreography is pretty bombastic. Love the fight choreography. It's so mm-hmm. good. Ma- Monty Um Lovely. did a work on the fight choreography in Ruby. Oh, my right. gosh. Mm-hmm. Do you want to know another show that has, like, very good, um, where it ties in, like, its fight choreography and its weapons very well to its characters? Arcane. Because. That's good mm-hmm. Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically. So, yeah. So, when you think of what, like, the first and most obvious one that I can think of is Vi. And Vi, as a brawler, from, you know, from her origin, you know. Like, unfortunately, starting out with League, <laughs> like, everyone's always known her for, like, the, the Hex Tech gauntlets, but, like, Arcane really fleshed out the reasoning behind that. It's because of Vander, um, who is, you know, who, who, who Vi has that close relationship with. Mm-hmm. And pass, uh, like, kind of, like, embracing that mantle, basically, like, it makes sense for her now to be having the Hex Tech gauntlets, but also, like, giving it purpose, I think, because... Um, in contrast to like, and, and that's kind of like thing. Basically, my point is like the the designs and the weapons that people like that are are tied to everyone in Arcane just makes sense. Like Jinx's, Jinx's like explosive, um, Jinx's like initial explosive personality when it came to you know her as a lead character makes sense to have big explosive weapons. Um, when it comes to Jace, for example, like, you know, him being the son of, like, famous smiths, like, having a giant hammer makes sense. Um, and I think that's, the, like, with Echo 2 having, um, like, with Echo 2, like, having the weapons that he has and, you know, every, like, I don't, like, they... I lost my train of thought. Basically, just to go back to Vi and Jinx, they kind of contrast themselves really well, actually, because like their weapons themselves 
contrast their personalities, which is really well done. Like obviously Vi is a bit more, you know, melee brawler type, and then Jinx is not just a more thing, not just prefers weapons, but like big explosive weapons. That contrasts them so well and it and it um it plays really well into like their dynamic, right? Especially given their history. So yeah. I lost my point there a little bit, but yeah, just yeah. See, I find this very interesting because I don't actually associate the arcane characters with their weapons at all, which might just be because I like have no experience with League at all. And like, I mean, like it makes sense for them to have good weapons because they come from League is a fighting game, right? I'm not making that up. Yes, League will be a fighting um, game. Don't explain it any further. We don't need to talk about League. It's a fighting game. Yeah. <laughs> but like, it's very interesting because you were like listing off characters and I'm like, what was their weapon again? Like, I remember Vi because the gauntlets are memorable. I remember Caitlyn has guns because you actually see her use them quite a bit. Mm. But like beyond that, I was just like, wait, what was their weapon again? So it's very interesting I, that you say that because like, I don't, I don't associate that show with the weapons at all. I, I think there's a fun intertextual play with Arcane that I've talked about with my friends who play League religiously where they don't start off as characters that are inherently inclined to the weapons you'd think compared to like ruby ruby right from the start you see ruby with the with the scythe and you go ruby's the scythe lady she swings the scythe she does all her stuff with it but like these characters become by the end the characters in their weapons so like vi is this very like bootstrap style really self-reliant street rat who then grows up to become part of like an industrial machine like she is part of the police force by the end so you see her punching people but then as the show goes on she starts to get help from other people she starts to become more reliant and then at the end she's still punching people but using weapons given to her by the authority figure and she punches like criminals with it or like uh, Powder, who turns into Jinx, starts off with these like little toy bombs. And then as she becomes more like, as she goes through her trauma and becomes more violent and more aggressive, she then starts to use these bombs like weapons and less like toys or like things to commit theft with. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah, like I, I completely agree with you where when I first started watching it, I knew what the characters looked like from splash art. And I thought, why do these characters work the way they do? But in those last two episodes, everything kind of clicks. Yeah, I mean, Arcane's just good writing. So mm -hmm. take notes, I guess. <laughs> take notes, Ruby. Oh, um, God. But while we're here, should we start to transition into, you know, our own uses of weapons and artifacts and all that in our stories yeah yes yeah anyone yeah. like to volunteer to go first uh dean you posted the picture i volunteer you <laughs> okay i've been waiting to hear about them since you posted them like two weeks ago go okay uh so my weapons let me th so Alex thing, Alex initially said to post, uh, or, you know, to kind of talk about, like, one example. So here I am about to talk about nine. <laughs> so, um, the nine weapons that I have listed here, or, like, in, in the picture that I've shown and what I'm showing right now on screen, are the weapons of the nine mystics, uh, who are basically, like, the superheroes of the world. And that's not really doing it justice, basically, like, they are thing they are mortals who are given the power of gods and are imbued with um godly powers let's say that there are nine gods and the nine mystics each have their own signature weapons so um going from left to right we are starting with the melee weapons um you have porter twin batons people already know if you've listened to this podcast before Porter is the main protagonist. She uses a pair of twin batons um, to kind of talk about them a little bit in detail um, or as much as I can, really. So they are twin. They are twin telescope batons. You you um, unsheath them, basically, by click by pressing on all those four buttons at once. Um, there's an amethyst pummel to, pummel to keep it from slipping, and they are a strong polymer 
they're like a strong polymer plastic, but I'm thinking of making the metal just, you know, uh, from the bottom there, there is, um, Aloe's family hatchet. Um, so Aloe is a character that I have not introduced yet in the canon, but it is an OC and a eventual mystic. So his family hatchet ties into, and, and I'll kind of go over this briefly because again, I am still working on the canon for a lot of these characters, but, um, yeah, Aloe is... His family hatchet is was been passed has been passed down to him from uh, different generations. His people, uh, the Ivanic, yeah, the Ivanic are very honorable people. They maintain tradition a lot, and will play into his eventual narrative when when I kind of get there. Basically, uh, Evercho, uh, who is another mystic that I have not introduced yet, is a sword user and particularly has the Judgment Blade, um, wherein. It's called that because his, um, because their father who, or because his father who's, um, a very notable figure within his area of, within Avercho's area of the world, uh, was a judge. And, you know, the whole concept of, like, judge, jury, and executioner wanted to play that, or I wanted to personify that into a blade. So, I don't know if it's going to be sentient yet, but we'll see. So... Yeah, it's not, it's a really kind of like standard sword. I haven't given much lore yet, but yeah, that's the Judgment Blade. Uh, Nova's Norun. Um, so Nova, so Nova is again another mystic that I have not introduced yet, but they are, I think like Nova's, so the Norun is a great sword with um, runes along the edge of the blade. It's depending on the power, like depending on the runes that are on display, that grants you different powers and abilities. Um, there are currently supposed to be six on there, but I only had room on the page for five. But yeah, there are six runes total. Um, the powers of which I haven't determined yet, but basically just with a Nor rune, your max limit of runes per blade is six. You can't really have any more than that because, like, I've, you know, obviously scaling and overpower and, you know, too much power and all that. Um, but yeah, it's a great sword. It's held uh, by two hands and uh, yeah plays a lot into her narrative um then we have the scythe which is Woo! love oh, the scythe yeah. Woo! yeah which is my favorite my favorite weapon to have designed so far so the sila is the weapon of the silos who are basically the valkyries in or who are basically valkyries their signature weapon is the, uh, is the staff that has if you see in the like if you see that gemstone it is a gemstone that has been blessed by the harlequin and the harlequin opal is this giant gemstone in the heart of zor so it's it's where this land is and basically as it, it that's the source of the zoran's power so having been blessed this um each sila is capable of ranged combat and melee combat so when in ranged combat, you're able to fire magical bursts. For now, I haven't decided like the full like the full scope of it yet. But basically, you know, just like magical blasts and shit. But the cool thing about it, and um, what Brit is able to do with it is a scythe blade, cause that's sick. <laughs> it's awesome. Like I wanted thing like when I was originally thinking about it, I was like, I want a scythe. So I made a scythe out of, like, this thing, out of this, like, I can't really define it yet. It's not light magic, because light magic in itself is its um, is its own thing in my world. But basically, yeah, it's like, ma like it's, a, it's, a, it's a magical scythe that protrudes from, that forms from one side of the staff. Um, so yeah, that is the Scylla. On the ranged weapons, there is Magnus Bow Marno, who is named after the... It, who is named after the goddess of the flame, Marnarwe. Um The the bow itself is a collapsible compound bow, wherein it doesn't really look like this here, but in, within the story, Magna is able to collapse it and carry and carry it around with her by lashing it onto her belt, as in the story. Um, when it is drawn, it has a very light draw to it, but it is extremely deadly um, in her hands. It was passed down from her grandfather who 
um, within within the lore of Magna's family, they are a military family, so it is expected for Magna to carry this bow with the high honor of um, of the Idana name. But you know, she's been able to kind of customize it the way that she wants. So you have like wildfires along the edge of the bow, which is what the little scratch marks are here. Um, wooden grip, different variety of arrowheads there. So that is Marna. Um, the Sunburst. The Sunburst is a Edtonic rifle. So I've talked about the Edtonic weapons before, but basically they are your pistols, shotguns, assault rifles, snipers, um, PDWs, which I have a whole separate page for, which I will upload right now. So quick side tangent on the Atonic weapons. So they are a combination between two um between two uh of the five magic systems which i've spoken about on previous episodes of the podcast the um the atonic weapons are combina- like are a combination of fire and lightning magic which basically means like it's um so yeah in order to charge th- or in order to use this weapon basically you need um you need the magazine or a battery this battery like allows the weapon to shoot a certain number of shots before the battery is completely drained and then you have to reload so it's basically just like a weapon but except for bullets you fire energy shots um and the sunburst is a custom detailed as you can see thing as you can see from the list that i just posted it is a custom ghoul um, and the reason why it's called Sunburst is because the little dots there glow up or glow whenever Gancho uses it. And I just thought that was cool. Um, Rorsch's pistol is another character, or thing, is another mystic's weapon. It's just a... It is also another um, atonic weapon, the original. And Rorsch usually prefers it with a silencer and almost only uses the pistol because... As I have yet to write in their canon, but what is basically their character, if you if you get into an if you get into a situation where you need more than seven bullets, you shouldn't have gotten into that situation in the first place. So yeah, so that tells a lot about Roche's character. So they are a lot more low profile. They don't really like to get into like high engagements, but they have that pistol on them to kind of help wherever possible. It's not a special custom named pistol because again they don't really see any kind of value to that but they do have one in case something goes wrong um and finally there is uh cielo moira's reaver armor who is um who i have po- who like cielo moira is a character that i have introduced in like i've talked about them briefly before but basically they are chaotic so chaotic are are horned cre- are, are horned beings they're supposed to be dark elves but rather than rather than the traditional ears they instead have their horns which basically act as like i don't know like they it's it's a whole bunch of like stuff that i haven't really explained thoroughly yet in canon but basically their entire reaver armor um is think of like the iron man suit Right. So it's they're either they're able to like enter and exit it just on a whim. Their mask, as you can see here, um, can retract at will whenever they need it to be and is very highly detailed. The reason why it's called like their the Reaver armor is the Reaver armor, as I will explain here, is um so yeah, it's been re-engineered to like it was originally a suit of armor for a standard chaotic uh thing for standard chaotic military like personnel, but um CLO, who is a famous engineer themselves, has redesigned it to or re-engineered it to fly and camouflage itself in the night. Um they it's outfitted with uh standard like atonic guns and missiles, so yeah. I have a lot more to kind of say on these and like how these weapons kind of factor into everyone's respective canon, but basically, yeah, these are the nine weapons of um, my 
these are the nine or thing these are the nine weapons of the seventh age mystics who i will gradually be introducing as my series progresses i got, I got a question about the armor yes is it a mech suit uh i don't it sounds it sounds like it has a lot of abilities of a mech suit just 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 my my immediate every reaction was like damn i want to see a mech fight Porter and Magna, because that'd be pretty dope. Anyways. Mm. Do, did I show you what it looked like, Tyler? Because I will just take a picture of it for you. I see that I'm assuming the helmet on the one page. Yeah, that's the helmet. Or when it's fully formed. I took a photo of... Or I originally drew the character without their helmet. Oh. Or yeah, without no, the helmet fully formed. See? Ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah. Jeopardy theme song. Insert here. Um, yeah, right here. Anyway. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's the Reaver. So that is their armor set. The Reaver. They're known as the Reaver, basically. God, y'all make me wish I could fucking draw. I'm just like, every time I see one of Dean's art pieces, I'm just like, how do you put that much fucking detail into it like it looks so like intricate and like mechanical mm -hmm. it's Cute. so impressive i'm like i draw like ruffles and flounce i can't draw stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> thank you i appreciate it yeah it, it takes a long time to kind of like because especially since i'm drawing with you know since i'm drawing on paper if i fuck up i don't have good erasers <laughs> <laughs> art eraser oh my god i don't have money <laughs> they're not expensive yeah just just go to michael's and steal one um anyways <laughs> so like mm -hmm. i do love how you talked about each character with each weapon showing you put thought into what they do and who they are which we've always been talking about here and mm -hmm. i especially enjoy the legacy some of these weapons have also a good quality we've talked about um like given the readings that i've given i've done i've obviously only seen magna and porter use their weapons at current juncture mm -hmm. um and i remember us talking about like fighting style and how to include that and how to make it a bit more tactile and real um can i share a bit of the uh talk that we had about it yeah absolutely go ahead one thing i always say to people writing fight scenes and stuff like that is uh write what you know or write what you can learn especially when it comes to fighting if you've never been in a fight especially a fight with a deadly weapon be careful it's not all the media cracks it up to be. Um, and writing it, you have to take some special precautions. I'm not saying go get in a fight, but maybe talk to people who have been into a real fight. It adds quite an edge to uh, what's going on. Yeah. I think, uh, mm -hmm. I think a big element that a lot of people miss, which, like, Tyler really hit the nail on the head there, where it's... A lot of situations where people who don't understand the visceral nature of a fight are more inclined to the excitement of a fight than what it would feel for someone in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a big thing that I find is constantly lost in fights is fear. It doesn't actually need to be that the characters are afraid, but it needs to be a tension in the reader or watcher that there is inherent danger because a lot of fights then feel more like sport. The best comparison, which is like the penultimate good versus bad fight scene, is the Star Wars lightsaber fight scenes, where you can see it in the prequels, where they look like dance choreography, i.e. a sport, versus in like episodes 4, 5, and 6, where it looks like two people who are very emotionally heated are swinging around things that could kill the other person. It looks like they're both afraid of the weapon and they're both constantly focused on it. But in the prequels, you can see like Darth Maul like doing backflips and flying around or Yoda doing the same thing. And nobody's really taking the presence of a lightsaber seriously. Ah, uh, the sea drama fight sequences. <laughs> okay. 
Um, if it's okay, I have a lot more to share. Oh my god, Dean! I yeah. said like one thing. No, I'll, I no, I'm just I'm just showing it. I'm just so, showing it to you guys right now, and it's up to you guys if you want to hear more about it. But right now, I'm just showing you guys pictures because I was given... doing a lot of thing. I was doing a lot of work lately. <laughs> Have you given Dean a Xeno episode yet? We should do one because, oh my god, I don't That's think a... we have time to talk about all of this right now. But we. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not going episode. to. I just wanted to show you guys the work that I've been doing. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. How have you not given Dean an episode? Like, I've seen He's Dean a collective master. like fifteen hours over the last several years, and at least a third of that time was this. Uh, yeah. Dean is the guildmaster. He can give himself his own damn episode whenever <laughs> I, he pleases. See, no, that's the thing. Like, I don't want to think. I don't want to do that. I want, like, I want thing. I want like a diamond dagger episode. I want thing. I want like a mythic cosmos episode. Oh my god, Michael, you'd be all over the mythic cosmos. I swear to God. Damn straight. I feel I like you would. I feel like you would. Yeah. Um, I have something to say about all of that after the episode. Alex, who's next? Um, Gabe, you've been okay. talk. Yeah, I saw. Um, so during the world building episode, Michael, you were not on for so I'll, I'll recap what I'm about to talk about. Um, I talked a bit about uh, the Mist Sea, which is a it's a, it's a thing in the world of uh, the Glass Inferno, which is a, a fan. This is my fantasy series. Um, this is not the Mad Max one we talked about, right? This is the other one. This this is not. Yeah, this is not Love yeah. Heart. Love and Heart, I, I, I wanted to talk about, but I realized I don't have a lot of, like, weapons and stuff that isn't, like, real world or just mechs. Which, like, I love mechs, but I don't really know how to talk about mechs or, like, stretch talking about mechs. They're just mechs. We all know what mechs are. We don't know what the deal is. Um, but with, uh, so, in in the world of Glass Inferno, the world of Glass Inferno is called Ildry, and on Ildry, in between the two big land masses, um, there is something called the Mist Sea, which is, like, a sort of ocean that is like made out of a, a very thick toxic fog uh, that is mostly traversed using like airships or like floating uh, boats or like shit like that. And a lot of, uh, and, and a lot, it, se- it seemed like, it seemed like while I was talking about it in the world building episode, this piqued some interest. So I, th- so I thought I'd talk about more mist sea stuff. Gabe. Yeah? Am I not coming through at all? No, you're good. I just want to ask you to repeat one of the words you said. Say it. Pequeed. Delete him. Send him to I... Edmonton. Yeah, I just I just wanted to make sure that's that that's what you actually said and the... that my ears weren't deceiving me because you like to mispronounce words on purpose to annoy us. <laughs> Yeah, no. I uh, you heard you heard right. I said Pequeed. Oh, <laughs> you can stop saying it now. Okay. I didn't Alex, hear the third time. Alex, your, your aura is so threatening right now, and I fucking love it. <laughs> you can't see me right now, but I am leaning very close to my microphone. <laughs> I, I can like hear it. I can like. Yeah. I can. I can tell. <laughs> Good. Continue. Um. So. Basically, yeah. With the mist sea, um, there's lots of like creatures in the mist sea that are that are that are dangerous and the mist sea itself is super toxic so there's like various weapons and technology that are associated i don't have a lot i don't have any pictures of them unfortunately i didn't get the chance to draw any of them but i do have this hero forge of a guy who is like he's a character in the glass inferno and his whole thing is he's a he's a mist sea smuggler um and he has a bunch of he has a bunch of weapons that are that are specifically mist sea designed uh and so there's so there's basically the the key points here are his gun and the two uh, melee weapons. Uh, so basically, the the gun. I don't have a specific name for it yet. I haven't done a lot of work on this stuff. I'll be super honest. But the gun is basically designed because the missy is like extremely thick. Um, it's already hard to like maneuver around the mist sea, uh, and. And so the gun is designed in such a way that, like the 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 projectiles that it fires, like puncture through the fog, and like it, they fire basically they fire like extremely fast projectiles, like 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 the, the, the like they like they're they're designed so that they can they can go that fast because like that's the only way that they can actually like 
get any mileage uh, in the Mist Sea, and the two weapons that he has are are both carbon fiber blades, um, which are there's like there are these uh, creatures in the in the Mist Sea. There's like uh, hang on, I have a name for it. There's like there's like mist. There's like a, a species called the Wyrats, which are these like floating shark creatures, and these carbon fiber blades are the only thing that can puncture their their hide. So anyone who's traversing the Mist Sea has to have at least one weapon that is equipped with like a carbon fiber blade or you're basically fucked. And the gas mask is because of course, like I said, breathing in uh, the mist sea is like extremely toxic. Uh, yeah. I don't have as much uh, as, as Dean prepared, unfortunately tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> you have thing. Your, your work was good, Gabe. <laughs> I just I just did a lot. It's mine was thing. Mine was quantity. You you got your shit figured out. I still need to do that on my end. Um, Very hard to have your shit figured out as a writer. That is true. What designation did you give the weapon on his back again? It is it is a it's it's the 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 material or like the actual type of weapon he has. Type. It's like a it's like a spear. It's like a pull. It's like a thing. It's a spear thingy. So, like, weapon nut here. That mm-hmm. looks specifically like uh, an Eastern style halberd. I believe the term I'm looking for is naginata. Yep. Yep. Um, I mean, I mean, like, uh, there's also the Chinese one, but they're literally called Chinese halberds now. Yes. So I think you can kind of cheat it. Gonna go with it's Chinese. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go yeah. with Nagi, not that. Um, classification: very good chopping weapon, very much like. If you're gonna use descriptions of that, watch some old martial arts movies to see how someone actually uses them, because they're very very flashy and fancy if you want them to be. But mainly, they were used as an infantry weapon on the front line, analogous to regular spears and halberds in the West. Um, if I remember correctly, very good anti-cavalry weapon. As well. You'd also want to check out Soul Calibur. Soul Calibur is a good distillation of all those like really obnoxious kung fu style not uh, kung fu movie stylings, not the actual martial art, but like uh you could play Soul Calibur and there's I think three characters with that style. Some are pole more pole arms, some are more literal halberd, but that flashiness you could see in something like that. Always use a halberd with two hands, kids. Also a good important bit. Unless you're a Shaolin monk, use a halberd with two hands. <laughs> Anyways. Or, or if you're the characters in Soul Eater Not, you can use all four. Uh, um, anyway, Gabe, is that your section? Uh, that's my section, yeah. Sorry, it's way shorter. No, that's fine. That's you're good. You're good. Uh, I don't know who wants to go next. Tyler, you said you don't have any specific weapons, right? Um, I have a thing. But, like, I love going last in the order. It's basically a meme to me now. <laughs> do we, do you, so, Michael, do you want to go next or do you want me to go next? Go oh, ahead. I can, I can go next. No, yeah. no more, no more bottom for me today. So, I don't, <laughs> I don't have anything of real note. I've got like some very vague ideas because Dean knows whenever he throws me on here, I'm improv this stuff super hard. So, I've got two. One is more like an item slash suit of armor. The other one is more like a character. But there's a... I'll do the character one first. There's an idea that I've been trying to float by Gabe once or twice on the Lemon Heart story, because I love yes. post-apocalypses, where I wanted to try and set up either a subcontinent or try and just more or less inject my own idea into his story, where I had my own post-apocalyptic idea for the longest time and i wanted to have it based around companionship uh based on the classic boy and his dog archetype and post-apocalyptic movie but i wanted the animals to be a mount and the person works in tandem with the animal to survive the best comparison i have for an image is if anyone's played horizon forbidden west uh there's a group of raiders that ride the elephants in those games a la like hannibal 
And I'd want something like that, but for very large dogs, very large cats, birds, etc. And the weapons themselves are technically separate from the animal, but the animal itself also plays in as a weapon. And then each respective animal says something about the rider. So like someone who's very peaceful pacifist might have like a turtle and the turtle stores water. And he doesn't really have much weapons because he's a very peaceful farmer, but he might have little bits of self-defense, might have sensors along the outcropping of his farmland, or there might be like a bandit queen who rides a bat and it's a very large bat with chain guns and she's all about going in and causing lots of damage because she's the leader of a pack of really aggressive warriors. I love her. Girl power. The- mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I... I- I kind of had two characters that I played around with for the longest time. One is the lead, the like Mad Max style straight man that rides a dog. And the dog has like a V18 style, like big ass uh, semi truck engine in its chest. And so it's partial animal and partial machine. So there's a whole bunch around like care for the animal, but also like caping of the vehicle. And then the other one was the main villain who was the lady that had the bat. And she's just this full bravado, a Morton Joe style Mad Max villain who plays full grandeur in the post apocalypse. And then the other one, uh, if I needed to be very specific and had an actual weapon weapon was my buddy and Everest and I love to brainstorm. Oh gosh, where did I just put it? Loves to brainstorm fake stands for a part nine jojo that we like to write in our free time oh boy so i just thought why not throw one of mine out there so i'll post an image but i had this one floating around which is a mask you would put on and it looks like a three-face mask if anyone has seen those from old like biblical paintings uh i will post it but uh, it's called Fancy Clown based on an MF Doom song. And it is based around uh, the ability to transform and move cloth. And you would be able to shrink and grow specific types of cloth uh, depending on what you've touched recently. So if you walked by someone and touched their like cotton shirt, you could make it grow really big and then wrap it around them and choke them out if it was a battle or if it was like a situation where you're threatening someone and they have really thick like wool clothes on, you could shrink it to restrict their movement. And I've been reading a lot of like thrillers and watching thrillers recently. So I've gotten into all these ideas around like head games where you technically just touch someone so they are sitting in their own coffin and you decide when or if they have any type of harm done to them. Cool. Specifically specifically nice. the boys. I just binged all the boys this week. And the boys really plays around with that feeling of like a lethal threat has just walked into the room. What do the characters do in reaction to save their skin? And you never really know if someone's going to save their skin or not. I like the description of walking around in your own coffin. That's pretty metal. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I cannot cool. stop thinking of your stand as the gene controller. Because, like, you can control fabric material, yes, but do you really want to control denim? It's just kind of tacky. Hey, denim's a good work I, material. No, I don't like denim. I'll be honest. I don't like denim. Sorry, this is not a critique of your character at all. I dig the concept. I'm critiquing denim specifically. <laughs> I think I think denim's a strong material. I'm not I'm not feeling my denim pants right now and feeling attacked. (laughs) (laughs) I think I think if we're talking like unrelated to the podcast fashion wise, denim is okay. okay. I think for the story, it has a fair bit of power because of how strong it is. Ah, mm-hmm. I see, I see. It is very, has a big tensile strength to it. I imagine this character is, like, specifically very fashionable as well, given their ability. One mm-hmm. sentence summary for the part, because it's been a multi-year-long conversation with Everest and I. It would be The Bachelor, and then every single person on The Bachelor Island 
is an enemy and they're all trying to kill each other off while the show's not airing. Oh, a la stand cool. fights. That's cool. You know what? That sounds better than The Bachelor. I'd watch it. That sounds way better. Yeah. It sounds a uh, kind of kind of Hunger Games, but like eh, I could dig. You could tell me the recipe for a cupcake. That would sound better than The Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah cupcakes cupcake. are good. Yeah, cupcakes are good. <laughs> <laughs> cupcakes. But also, like, listen, I'm not into JoJo, but I see art of JoJo all the time because all of my friends are into JoJo. Those guys are styling. I don't know if it's a good style, but they've got style. Mm-hmm. It's- I mean, the thing is with style, like, if you if you're comfortable, if you like what you're wearing, then you'll always look good. Unless again, I don't know if they look good but they have a style <laughs> <laughs> i second Sorry that. to jojo fans <laughs> yeah, i second that opinion it's the it, it kind of plays into our prior conversations about like thematic consistently and i found it so weird that the writer of jojo for almost 30 years has been very wholeheartedly t- taking fashion trends and supermodel styles from the 80s but never literally just had a character based around fashion and i thought what if there was just a character who was obsessed with fashion and clothes and that became their workaround oh that's a that's a solid theme it fits really well in and i'm very surprised there isn't one you are correct Mm -hmm. cool so those are your magical items yeah i I I have four or five books next to me in case we had to pull out like other people's examples. I actually teased Dean last time because I was going to talk about Bayonetta's shoes, but that's about it. No, that's fun. Um, I guess I can talk about my items now. Um, I also do not have art. I have tried to draw my daggers many times and I have never managed to, to get them to a point where I'm satisfied with them. Um, well, they're just tricky because, like, I mean, they're they're called the diamond daggers for a reason. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, in my in my world, Katariana, I guess I need to specify which world it is. <laughs> um, on Katariana, in that world, um, there are six very like high level, powerful like artifact level magical weapons they're called the diamond daggers they are daggers um they are very powerful they're probably overpowered they came about that way because i made my vampires overpowered and i needed a way to kill them (laughs) um so the diamond daggers basically were created as a way to kill vampires which didn't have a way of being killed before that that's why they exist um in the time of the diamond dagger the novel there are only three in existence um and adahe the main character is going to fetch one in order to kill a vampire basically that's a very general plot summary of the book (laughs) it gets more complicated than that but that's like the general plot um the daggers are cool i came up with them on a whim like years and years ago when i was first like conceptualizing this story and they've changed a lot over time um the concept is like i call them diamond i don't think they're like actually made of diamonds um but they are made of like a clear crystal material um very solid like tough strong um that's why they're called diamond daggers because diamond is probably the like most comparable thing to them in the like material world um but the thing about them that makes them special is that they were forged in like the blood of powerful beings um specifically the zaruni and the drar who i've talked about in other episodes um and because of like the lore of vampires and how they were created um the vampires have like the blood of the Zaruni and the Drar like in them and that's like what makes them vampires and as a result only like weapons forged in that type of blood is capable of like destroying them um yeah 
that's kind of the general basis of them. Um, there are also like general diamond weapons. The diamond daggers are like really special and specific and also have other magical powers that I haven't fully fleshed out yet. Um, but they let their users use like very powerful like blood magic and stuff like that. Um, like I said, there's only six of them in existence. Within like the canon lore of my story, one of them is missing, so there's only five like in play, and only very specific characters have them. Ahe being one of them because she gets it very early in the story. And each of the daggers, because I think it's fun to color code them, each of them has a different colored gemstone in their hilt. Um, and they kind of like correspond to, you know, the person that owns them to an extent. Um, so out of his dagger, which is named Akello, has a green gemstone in the handle. Um, and then the other two daggers that are in existence when she gets her dagger uh, have a blue gemstone and a red gemstone. And then the other three are different colors. Um, and then, like I said, there are also just like general diamond weapons, which can only be forged by vampires because they are like formed in like they're forged in like the blood of a vampire. Um, because I wanted there to be like, you know, more ways to kill vampires so that they're not completely overpowered. <laughs> um but the thing about these weapons is that they don't have like the extra bonus magical powers and they also need to be like, like they, they run out basically of this ability. Um, so you can like make a sword, but eventually it's going to stop working with its intended like purpose to kill vampires unless it is again, like reforged in the blood. So that's kind of like their weakness, but they're still pretty powerful weapons. Okay, I've been rambling. Questions? Uh, I love the color coding and mm -hmm. you talking about them being crystal. I immediately see them as like different colors reflecting out of a prism, which mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, that that's different. cool, yeah. If like the color coding was more important than just, you know, color coding or if you had like lower reasons for that, but that's what I immediately saw was like, you know, uh, Dark Side of the Moon album cover, whatever that stupid album is <laughs> yeah i mean they probably would work like that that wasn't my the reason that i originally color coded them was because i wanted to associate them with like the character that wielded them but then i actually changed who the wielders are so they don't like quite line up anymore but there's still like an intention behind them so for example um red is obviously a color that is associated with vampires because blood is red and all that um the character that wields the red dagger is the head of like uh, a vampire hunting organization. He's not a vampire. Um, and specifically the people in this organization are not vampires, but they are specifically against vampires and like hunt them down. And so he has the red dagger, which kind of symbolizes that. Um, Alehe has the green one just because in my head, she's the green character. <laughs> I tend to color code Love my characters as well. Love that for her. Um, I'm trying to remember what other ones I have. Hold on, let me pull up my dog. I can't talk about the blue one because that has, like, spoilers. If you're curious, we can talk about it after the podcast, but I won't talk about it on the podcast. Um, and then the one that's missing is the orange dagger. No one knows where it is. It's been gone for, like, probably at least a thousand years. People know it exists. People have seen it. They don't know where it is. Um, and the yellow one is wielded by another, a different organization. They don't hunt vampires, but they deal with, like, you know, um, prophetism and, like, future magic. And so having the dagger, uh, I, I'm, like, trying to figure out a way to talk about this without talking about Makatilo, but I can't talk about them without talking about Makatilo, because they're tied to Makatilo. <laughs> um, and Makatilo is, like, it's like the realm between realms in my multiverse. Um, and each of the daggers is actually tied to a different guardian of Makatilo. And so the yellow dagger is tied to um, the guardian that's associated with like space and like, like stars and that kind of stuff. And so um, his dagger is often used, like can be used for like, 
like prophetism and like astrological purposes and like being able to like see through space if that makes sense um and so his yeah so his dagger is associated with that stuff and that's why that group has that dagger <laughs> it's all very complicated i no no it it's building right like we've mm -hmm. been talking about it's got legacy it's got importance they're not just MacGuffins. they have defined abilities and uses and even like organizations and cultures seemingly built around them mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. plus they're, they're like fun. vampire killers so that's always fun they are <sighs> they are used to kill vampires and more I... importantly the varbris which i don't know i've only talked about them briefly on here but like they're like if power, if vampires are overpowered, Barbaris are like the next level <laughs> of overpowered, mm -hmm. um, and even harder to kill. One of the rules I set for for the Barbaris is that they can't be killed by regular diamond weapons. They can only be killed by these special, like diamond daggers, because they've like buffed themselves so much. Mm -hmm. um, so. And they're, they tend to be really bad people, so being able to kill them is kind of important. Uh, might I just one side anecdote? God, I'm stupid. Every time you've said diamond dagger, I thought dime and dagger. And I was like, that's unique. I wonder what that's about. No, Tyler, you're just a fucking idiot. <laughs> diamond dagger, you have to flip a coin, you live or you die. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea what I was thinking about. Anyways. That's very funny. No, diamond like the gemstone. Makes more sense. A lot more sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that's kind of the, the general explanation of my diamond daggers. All of the diamond daggers have names as well. Um, I'm considering changing some of them. But the ones that I know I'm keeping are the first two that I came up with, which are the green and the blue one, and they're named Okello and Akella, and they're specifically supposed to be like twin daggers. Ooh, Any plan to use them for like? Oh, sorry, Tyler, go ahead. Any plans for making them think? They are like semi sentient. They're not like fully sentient, um, but there are like rules about like who can wield them. Um, I haven't, I didn't talk about the purple dagger at all, but I have a character who wields the purple dagger, and the way that she became the wielder of that dagger was she killed the previous wielder of that dagger. Um, and like, because of, because of that like series of events, she was able to take ownership of it. Um, they don't all work exactly like that. There's like, they're, they're kind of different, but generally most of the time, they tend to form a bond to their wielder and cannot be used to harm that wielder. So, like, if someone, like, stole a kello from Alahe and tried to stab her with it, it wouldn't work. Oh, so purple's, like, a cheater. Got it. Little well, she didn't kill him with the dagger. Ah. <laughs> but also, the previous wielder of that dagger was... Not a good person, so... Yeah, it's justified. Yeah. And the purple dagger comes from, like... Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the purple dagger comes from someone who's, like, very... Like, the guardian that formed it, basically, um, is, like, a very loyal person. Um, so would, would, in that case, especially not be used against its wielder, um, but is also, like capable of recognizing corruption to an extent and so knows when it's being used for like ill deeds um and so when it's like freed from its bond with like a corrupt person will bond to like the person that freed it and if that person uses it for worse means then like that happens and there's nothing it can do about that but you know Loyalty comes with a price. I love me cut some good stabbers. Good stabbers are always good. Mm -hmm. but yeah, those are those are the diamond dag daggers. God, wow, I can't stop hearing dime and. Damn it. <laughs> um, but yeah, if there's no further questions, Tyler. Hi. 
I'm not a weapon. It's You're a, a typewriter. typewriter. Yep. Does it have an eye? Or is nope. that just the shadow? It's, it's a regular typewriter. Okay. Um, it looks like it has an eye. That would be pretty cool. Sadly, like it's, it's not smiling. Like, it's not th that. The actual item itself isn't that cool. Um, I suck at designing, like, magic weapons and stuff. I I avoid it almost like the plague. Magic systems and stuff, great. Good, good, good. The magic items have so much issues with origin and power level and scope. I love designing a good fighting style. I love designing a, a themed weapon for a character. Um, it, it happens a lot in D&D. I'm very good at theming weapons to characters. And uh, as a DM, I've handed out many custom magic items that relate specifically to the character my players are trying to play. And I find that very rewarding and good. But when it comes to, to my characters, I don't do a lot of fighting in my books, to be honest. A, a lot of my shit ends with my characters dead. They're not allowed to fight back. They're, they're my pawns. I love how Marisa like giggled behind me at that. Um, <laughs> yeah, she she knows most of my stories. Um, so I was having a lot of trouble coming up with something for this. There are a few minor examples I've made in the past, but none of them were good. And then I realized literally yesterday I was reading way too much House of Leaves in preparation for our episode on Thursday and desired the urge to make something unbelievably ergodic and ended up making a an SCP with a story Ooh. wrapped around it. So here's my typewriter. Uh, its name is La Malice, which is just French for the malice. It is not inventive at all. Uh, it's got a hell of a story behind it. So its first recorded usage is by a French revolutionary named Jean-Paul Marat. Um, he was a pamphleteer and newspaper writer during the French Revolution. Was responsible for many deaths during the name of the uh, in the name of the revolution during the Reign of Terror, and specifically uh, listing people who he thought were conspirators against the revolution and was an asshole who eventually got stabbed. Um, very important, very important. Uh, for anyone who cares, the typewriter is an Underwood Number no. Five which is mildly important to what this thing does, but we'll continue. Uh, after his assassination, the typewriter is stolen. Oh, I should I should preface this, by the way. Uh, this is pseudo-history, how this typewriter comes about, and it's going to be the edgiest, most kerfuffled story in existence until I explain what the typewriter actually does. So just be ready. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be you if it wasn't, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe some content warnings for, like, Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, and a few of those things, so, yay. Oh, uh, wow. Okay, Tyler. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. So, after Jean-Paul Moret is assassinated, the typewriter is stolen by an Austrian Marseillaise. The Marseillaise were groups of mercenaries hired by the revolutionary government to uh, enforce peace. Uh, they were often foreign mercenaries. Uh, after the fall of the Directory in 1799 and the Marseillaise were kicked out slash disbanded, he went home to Austria where the typewriter is kept as a family heirloom for about a hundred years until the family patriarch moves the family to Germany. Hi, yes, we're already at World War I and II. Um, because I couldn't think of anything to happen during the 1800s. That was fun. Uh, so... For those of you that don't know, Hitler got put in prison for a failed coup in Munich. Uh, during that time, he wrote Mein Kampf. He wrote it on this typewriter because hooray. Uh, after which, and he was elected into his power, uh, he passed it off to Joseph Goebbels, who was his propaganda minister and at one point an aspiring author. This typewriter was then used to write many of the Nazi propaganda programs. Uh, 1945 comes along, Hitler commits suicide, Joseph Goebbels and his family commit suicide in the Vorbunker in Berlin when the Russians come and take over the city. It is picked up by a Russian soldier and pawned off in Moscow, where it eventually bought by a one uh, Vyacheslav Molotov, first deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers of the Soviet Union. For those that don't know, this is where the term Molotov cocktail comes from. Uh, is this dude? Uh, yeah, I have been doing a lot of research recently. Can anyone tell? No. Uh, he was then used Absolutely to type the not. names. 
The, the typewriter was then used to type the names of people executed during the Soviet's Great Purge and the Red Terror. Uh, also during the Cold War, it was used to draft many of the black propaganda policies and anti-spy policies used by the Soviets. Uh, some undisclosed point during the 1950s, a spy for the other side stole La Malice from Molotov's office in an attempt to glean information through forensic examination of its keystrokes and solenoid cylinder. However, after taking it back to the head of the CIA, they could find fuck all. There's reasons for this. It is passed off until a CIA analyst just takes it home because it's an older model anyways and is not going to work for any of their necessary things. The analyst's son eventually takes it up as it sits in the basement doing nothing uh, until the analyst dies. The analyst's son is named Jonathan Michael Rosie. He inherits the family home and the typewriter. He's a bit of an aspiring author. He writes a manuscript known as The Bull Train on La Malice. After distribution of the small manuscript to those around his little town, he was widely ridiculed and critiqued, partially for being a black member of the community who was trying to, you know, do art in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and afterwards, he goes to write a rant on this typewriter. Uh, he basically just writes a quick throwaway letter of, oh, here's all the secrets and bad things that I know these town's members are doing. But as he continues writing, suddenly things are pouring from his fingertips that he has never seen or heard. Rumors and secrets of the people, his neighbors and the rest of the townsfolk that um, he wouldn't know. And he keeps writing and writing and writing and eventually creates a large multiple hundred page document listing basically every secret detail of the people's lives around him filled with quite a bit of anger and hatred realizing that some of these neighbors are beyond fucking redemption he creates copies of this and declares it uh, the name white propaganda which is a type of propaganda but also in relation once again to the racial tensions during this time and basically just walks and passes that shit out he is then killed by the townsfolk for revealing all of their dirty secrets. His house is burned. And to keep, you know, the burgeoning civil rights movement at bay, basically everyone in town swears silence. A town council is created to keep the peace and uh, make sure things like this don't happen again and make sure that no one blabs to the authorities. <sighs> Eventually, one of the town council members finds La Malice while searching for any evidence of these hidden uh, white propaganda with all the secrets in them. Uh, they find all the drafts of documents of the bull train as well as white propaganda and hold a big ass book burning, burning all of this guy's works, but they keep the typewriter. One of the town's people or one of the town council members uses it, writing their memoirs. But as they write their memoirs, they realize they messed up something, go to do an old timey backspace. And as they delete some of it, they realize that their memories of the event they were writing a memoir of are suddenly gone. Written out in the page in front of them, but they can have no memories of them. After a few tests, it's revealed that writing out your memories on La Malice and then censoring them with its handy dandy censor button uh, will erase them from your memory. The town council then begins to use La Malice to control its populace by, uh, if there's a ne'er-do-well, they force them to sit down, write out an account of what they've done, and then they will censor it. And they have been doing so for the past 15 to 20 years, controlling their entire population via what is essentially mind control and memory manipulation through La Malice. There's the whole story. Uh, that is just the backstory of the typewriter. The actual story going forward is going to be something else entirely. Uh, related to the typewriter. What does this typewriter do? Well, it's an artifact, obviously. It isn't sentient per se, but it is powerful. It's quite literally eating the memories that it is destroying, and it feeds off of a lot of human emotion. Hence its place in a lot of the worst parts of human history. It loves to feed off of wrath, hatred, anger, and those sorts of things. Um, it is completely anachronistic. And there were a few hints of it in the backstory. For one, Jean-Paul Marat never used a typewriter. Typewriters were not in circulation during the French Revolution. 
at all. There were a few prototypes that had existed since the 1500s, but there's no way he actually used one. He copied all these things by hand, then used a printing press to distribute them. During World War II, uh, Hitler was fully in jail when he wrote Mein Kampf. I don't think he even had access to a typewriter, let alone his own personal one. Um, further on, uh, the Great Purge that was described as being written on this typewriter happened during the 1930s, during Nazi Germany's reign, meaning that this typewriter would have had been in two places at once. Um, also, the fact that it's an Underwood number no. 5 means that it was produced in about 1900 or 1899, depending on sources, so it didn't even exist, this type of typewriter, in uh, the French Revolution or any times past. The idea is that this thing, as it's begun to eat more and more of human emotion, is beginning more and more powerful, and it keeps projecting itself further and further back into the past to either cause or be part of some of the worst atrocities in human history. And those that use the typewriter and know this story can't really tell if these great atrocities would have happened if the typewriter hadn't been there, or if it projecting itself back in time created these atrocities. And no one knows if it's actually from even further in the future being projected back into their current time. Damn. A sting. So yeah, there's my SCP. Uh, there is, like I said, a, a big old story that goes along after the town council starts doing their, their fucked up shit in what would be, I believe I was setting the main story in the 1980s for fun and stuff. That's a good for period fun. to, that's a good period for this typewriter to be in, yeah. Explore things, you know, burgeoning modern computers and all sorts of fun social dynamics going on. Uh, yeah, questions about La Malice, the Eldritch typewriter. I think I'm too tired to comprehend this right now. If if this became a long-running story, would it ever change form, or would it always stay that really archaic image of a 1900s typewriter in time periods it's not supposed to be? It, it wants to be the typewriter. It doesn't want to be anything else. That's fair. Um. <laughs> Lama Lise the MacBook. <laughs> yeah. Becomes the first word processing computer than a MacBook. Mm -hmm. It's now in modern times. It's a smartphone. No, it likes what it is. Mm -hmm. It knows what it is. Um, oh no, I th I honestly thought of the inverse, which would be even. I, I guess it could have like a gimmick, a gimmick or novelty feel to it. But I thought about it reversing, so it starts as a typewriter and then it starts to revert, or it, it chooses based on its own preference what it will be so it could be a pen and paper it could be a typewriter it could be simply just like some paint and a piece of paper for finger painting and based on the situation it can be different things for different people so like the finger painting one could be for a small child and the small child then shows an image of something that is to happen or someone else's secrets oh i see what you mean um, the Ooh. point of it staying a typewriter and the specific typewriter it is, is to keep that anachronistic element of it. It's not necessarily trying to hide. Mm -hmm. is the thing. Mm -hmm. It is just hungry. It's basically eating. And again, we're going to talk more about ergodic literature on Thursday, but in how anachronistic it is and the hints in its backstory as to it shouldn't exist in these points of times all is part of the story that ends up being told about it um yeah yeah i'll talk more about like my own ergodic literature stuff that i want to do on thursday because i've now developed this story a lot more than just a random musing about a typewriter in my brain but uh yeah not gabe you're awfully quiet <laughs> pardon I am not ready for that episode. You you finished House of Leaves. I haven't even finished House of Leaves. I think you're more ready. <laughs> I haven't even started it yet. I okay. I, I don't have it. Story, but I still haven't finished going through all the the appendixes. So, and also I finished it, but that doesn't mean I understand it. Fair points. Fair points. Uh, Gabe, you haven't mentioned anything about my Eldritch typewriter. I thought you'd be. I've just been listening. I've just been listening. Well, it's like caught in rap attention. Yeah. I love this shit. 
Yeah, no, I, I like I live for this shit. I, I, I was. I'm wondering, like, I don't know much about it. Like, how much of what you're, how much of like the history and stuff. Like, what I like, what what was the? I I can tell. Like, like there's no. Like, I can sort of tell like where the hit line between history and and imagine started, but like. It was is that true? Like did Hitler like make a like have a typewriter in prison and then gave it to Goebbels? Is that true? No. That's that oh. specific fan. Um okay. he did write Mein Kampf in prison. That I did know. Um but no, he didn't have a typewriter that he gave to Goebbels. No, that is entirely okay. about La Malice. Yeah, but the fact and I that, love this shit. Yeah, it's the fact that it ta- like gave need, feels the need to ask that makes it very like compelling, I think. Yeah, I've never, uh, I've never taken a crack at pseudo history before, but I really enjoyed this. I also, have it's like, awesome, right? I also have twenty five tabs open on everything from different types of typewriters and typing methods to, you know, World War Two, to the Red Scare, to racial injustice in the U.S. in the nineteen fifties and sixties. Like, this was a really fun research trip mm-hmm. for me. Being a writer's fun. <laughs> Yeah, love love having seven hundred research tabs open. Mm-hmm. It's great, right? It's the best. Love eating bandwidth. It's my favorite hobby. <laughs> what kinds of oh, cheese existed in England in fifteen seventy three? What's what style of greatsword would this would this character hold? Would best fit this character. Yeah, pain writer's fun. Anyways, mm-hmm. there's Tyler's weird research project on La Malice. Yeah, that's Hooray. really neat. Yeah, that's cool um, as fuck. Yeah, you that's should super like super cool. You should follow the advice I've been given and haven't followed about like doing like SCP stuff. SCPs, they they have issues. Mm-hmm. I like keeping my my stuff my stuff. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> He's fair. Yeah, fair. Mm-hmm. If ergodic literature doesn't pan out and this project dies like every other project I touch, uh, we'll see. Oof. <laughs> Just call us all out, huh? Not myself. I've, I've, I've been writing 30-page manuscripts for nigh on 15 years. Not a single one of them has gotten past 30 pages. I need to... I'm at how many pages for Xeno and I haven't written any... <laughs> I haven't written what? anything new, but you know what? I need to think. I need to flesh the world out a bit more. Maybe that's just what I'm needing to do first. That's like the problem with being a writer, though. It's like, oh, I can write. No, I need to figure this out first. Oh, I can write now. No, I need to figure this. It's just an endless cycle. At some point, you just have to accept that you can't figure out everything and just write. Just write. Write mm-hmm. more. Yeah, we have a anyway. we have a whole episode on that. Uh, check out writing advice, everyone. <laughs> the best writing advice is. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's everyone. Uh, any last minute thoughts? Um, I mean, I really want to buy a typewriter now. Anyways, me too. <laughs> I no, want- okay. I was I was going through like um like a uh, uh, like vintage antique store recently. Just like wandering through it, and there were so many typewriters in there, and I'm like, I just, I just want, you, like, you know, it's like it's for the novelty. They're so cool, mm-hmm. and I'm like a writer. I need a typewriter. It just needs uh, to exist in the same space as me, right? Mm-hmm. They're so cool. Yeah, typewriters are very like, it's it's just so associated with being a writer. I want like one of those like typewriter keyboards. I have one. They're fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're great. I, I've got one of those. I hook it up to my tablet. It's great. Yeah. Um. Another quick side note. Yeah. Just if we're going to to kind of go back a little bit on um, not necessarily on just my stuff because like I've talked loads about that already. But just yeah, like for, we should start planning out like individual like lore episodes, which we've talked about before. But just like yeah, Diamond Dagger episodes, you know, episode. We've wrapped up, Dean. Hmm? I think we can do this after we've wrapped up. Yeah. But yeah, just I'm just saying, like we should do that. Um, yeah. If there's no no more nothing else left to say, I think we can wrap up now. Uh so with all that being said, 
thank you everybody for listening in. We are at The Ink Guild on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter, but our main home is on YouTube and Spotify. You can also connect with us individually through our own social media. Check the description if you're on YouTube. Um, If you're interested in what we do, then consider subscribing to our Patreon for as low as $3 for exclusive content. Um, But ultimately, keep an eye out for more podcasts and other creative projects. Mm -hmm. Um, Real quick, let's do a little closing segment. Just throw throw out one random thing that you maybe considered talking about but ended up not talking about tonight. For me, I was considering talking about... Um, magical girl weapons because i think oh oh out of it's so good love them oh. I mean, i'm just saying next season if we wanted to do a magical girl episode i would not complain um <clears throat> mm-hmm. also yeah. magical girl charms the things they used to to like transform fascinating stuff i love magical girls um, get me on that episode please <laughs> what about oh, I, love, else? I love magical girls so much um for me, I kind of talked about this in previous episodes, but I didn't get to expand on it uh, in this episode. Uh, the conduits, which I'm showing, which I'm showing right now in the uh, on the recording. So yeah, there are five conduits uh, for the five corresponding magic systems. You basically need these conduits to be able to cast anything, and the way that you cast your spells corresponds to what it is. So, um, yeah. I'll, I, I can expand on that more in, in future episodes and maybe after this podcast, but yeah, just, yes, I want to talk more about the conduits, but like, that could be for like a magic system episode or something. Magic systems part two. Uh, so I was going to talk about weapons and usage in the name of the wind and wise man's fears and how they play a very interesting cultural importance in the one culture that Kowoth interacts with and magic wands in Harry Potter. Oh, that would have been a good one. And then we would have ripped J.K. Rowling a new one again. Fucking, I'm, just, I'm like, I don't like talking about Harry Potter. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Gabe Michael. Um, um, I sort of wanted to talk about uh, the rebellion in Yamato from Devil May Cry and just Devil May Cry's yeah, uh, a, a gorgeous weapon system. But that's more of like. I figured that was more of like a, a gameplay gush than like a, a, a universe or world building thing. So I decided I, I decided not to scream about how much I love Devil May Cry. Uh, I'll save that for later. I'll save that for another episode. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, I could have seen Gabe and I just completely taking this episode over talking about Yamato because it always just goes to Virgil and then a rabbit hole on that. Uh, I would have talked about the pile of books that I brought for Dean, but specifically the one about Bayonetta because it plays into that whole themes are the characters are the weapons, i.e. it's fashion, it is weapons, and it is confidence in that character. Also, just looks so cool. Mm -hmm. Guns on your feet. Yeah. Also, yeah, uh, for everyone listening, uh, thank you, Michael, for joining us this episode. Yeah, yeah, anytime. It was super fun. It was nice um, meeting you guys. And if to anyone listening, if any of those topics sound interesting, leave us a comment to let us know you'd like to see it in a future episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but thanks again for listening, everybody, and have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. <laughs>